um, uh, to one and all present uh, here. My name is uh, Julien Chess, and I'll be giving the welcome speech for today's webinar on uh, EU-China comprehensive agreements on investments. And, and also this series of three hour uh, events, which is starting today. So in the next uh, three, five minutes, my welcome speech, I'll be walking you through um, um, uh, what the webinar is about, how useful uh, we hope it's for you and, and what does the future hold in the context of the theme of this uh, webinar series. So, so today's events and next webinar are co-organized with my colleague and friend, Professor Mathieu Burnet. We'll also give you his uh, welcome remarks in, uh, in a few minutes. Let me just say that we are very grateful to the, the Queen Mary School of Law for the support it provides as a host. Uh, it's digital hosting and the credit goes to, to Queen Mary for that. We're also grateful uh, to the EU plan program uh, so indirectly to the European Union for... We're also grateful to the Asia Pacific FDI network. We have many members uh, today among the speakers and grateful also to the City uh, University of Hong Kong School of Law. So the theme of these events uh, reflects, I would say, growing recognition of the power and importance of China and the EU in international investment rulemaking and also the vital role investment law plays in shaping global economic governance. Um, as you know, the European Commission said on December 30, uh, 2020, that this Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, CAI, and I quote, will be ambitious agreements that China has ever concluded with a third country. So it sets the tone for our discussion today. The EU Commission also added that this new agreement should provide European investors better access to China's consumer market. So it's a major development in international economic law because this CAI has been um, seven years in the making with exactly 35 rounds of negotiations. And, and the agreement in principle um, that was weeks uh, ago uh, came at the surprise of many experts, came at the surprise of many experts because many would have assumed that more time was needed to um, achieve a number of, of results. We'll come back on that, but it seems that the EU's two largest uh, host countries of Chinese investments and contracts, that's Germany and France pushed a lot in December to get the deal done. Um, they pushed through the deal with or without consent from other member states. That's something we, we might want to discuss uh, today. Um, now, the EU-China Comprehensive Investments uh, Agreement on Investments is, is also as such uh, an important treaty. Um, but despite some optimism, the fact that it's new, that it's interesting for us lawyers or economists to, to talk about, there is already some criticism. And as good scholars, we are very likely to focus on the criticism. I'll try to very quickly summarize the criticism uh, we have encountered, we have heard over the last weeks. Uh, there are many things, but I would say that basically the, the criticism goes in three main directions. And these are the three main directions that we will explore today. Uh, firstly, some critics have focused their attention on issues in China, such as intellectual property, um, um, the lack of protection of intellectual property, the lack of reciprocal market access, the use of forced labor, the abuse of state subsidies and compulsory joint ventures. Um, many things that may only partly be addressed in the new CAI. And so for some people, for some experts, the CAI is very incomplete. Now, there are going to be many issues in this regard that we discussed. One of them is going to be SOEs, state-owned enterprise, for instance, because uh, uh, indeed, when, when looking at recent developments in China, it's 
push to make a Swiss more central in its economy um, may contradict a number of commitments um, that are part of the CI. A second um, main type of criticism is, is the fact that some experts um, have applauded to the New Deal, but they have questioned with, uh, or the extent to which the deal with will redress any of the main issues that still exist in between China and the EU. So there are major questions as for the implementation, the effective implementation of the CEI. Uh, there are also questions with respect to the fact that China refused investor state dispute mechanism under the new treaty. Although it's something very interesting, investor state dispute settlement still exists the uh, 25 battery investment treaties that were signed by the member states and China years ago. The third and the last um, array of criticism, which I want to highlight, uh, interestingly, are concerns with respect to the EU itself. That's something that we should not forget. Uh, there is also concern about what this CAI mean for the EU defensive toolbox which was adopted in 2021, uh, including the Vestager's white paper on subsidies. Um, there are questions also on the part of some experts which are more political, but there is this idea that perhaps China wanted to agree on, on the CI in late December, but might drag out in... And so some experts, uh, mostly political experts, are worried that Julien, we can't we can't hear you anymore. You are kind of frozen. Which are which are important for the future of China and EU investments relationship. I'm delighted to welcome um, all the participants. So I thank the experts for accepting uh, the invitation. I also want to thank uh, the lead discussants who have joined to share their their insights and knowledge. Uh, they will help us to to get started the discussion very very quickly we have two lead discussions per session and also one you welcome all of our colleagues and students uh, in attendance we have already more than 100 uh, people at, in attendance which is very good for this kind of event before coming to a close of these remarks and and hand over to Mathieu I would also like to remind you, and especially our moderators, to strictly stick to our time schedule and not to let any session overrun. So I sincerely hope you will enjoy today's uh, debate and, and webinar. We'll talk a little later in the conclusion about the next webinar in that series, which will take place uh, on March 29. Um, but I let you enjoy the discussion and I thank you uh, for your participation. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chess, uh, Cher Julien, for to start to start this event and a very warm welcome uh, to all participants uh, this morning uh, or this evening. My name is Mathieu Burnet and I'm an associate professor at Queen Mary University of London. And I must say it has been a real pleasure uh, to co-organize this event with Julien Chess and the Asia Pacific uh, FDI Network. Uh, I do have the pleasure at Queen Mary to coordinate the Jean Monnet Network on EU-China Legal and Judicial Cooperation, which brings together a number of European and Chinese universities to study the prospects, but also the challenges for EU-China Legal and Judicial Cooperation. And needless to say that for myself and for my colleagues who are part of the network, that this agreement, that the conclusion in principle of this agreement does constitute an important milestone. An important milestone for a bilateral relationship between the European Union and China, which has gone a very long way ever since the, the establishment of diplomatic relations between the European communities and China back in 1975. Also ever since the first, first references were made to a strategic partnership between the EU and China back in 2003, but also a bilateral relationship which still includes and involves a number of challenges. 
For the European Union, China has been considered simultaneously and in different policy areas as being either a cooperation partner, a negotiation partner, an economic competitor, or even a systemic rival. And it is very clear that from the, for the European Union, it has been from the very start of the establishment of those bilateral relations difficult to reconcile on the one side the protection and promotion of the EU's interests with the promotion of the values of the European Union and especially those values included in Article 21 of the Treaty on the European Union. In that regard, I mean, the European Union mantra on the need to establish a principled, pragmatic approach when engaging with China has been put, has been very much challenged in recent years, not least in view of recent developments in Hong Kong, but also in the Chinese province of Xinjiang. On the other side, from the Chinese perspective, it is also very clear that the bilateral relationship, the strategic partnership also includes and involves a number of challenges. Not only has the EU never truly lived up to the hope that China has always had into the European integration process, that is the European integration process that should lead to a greater multipolarity, but what we've also seen from the Chinese perspective in recent years is an, incre an increasing difficulty for China to divide in order to better rule the European Union. And it is very clear that the, that the transfer of a number of competence from the member states to the European Union at the time of the adoption of the Lisbon Treaty have definitely made uh, those uh, dynamics more difficult uh, from the Chinese perspective. That being said, and I just would like to, to, to finish by highlighting indeed the fact that the, the adoption in principle of the comprehensive agreement on investment does constitute an important milestone. The where, and there are still a number of challenges which directly relate to the bilateral investment relationship between the EU and China, a number of issues had to be negotiated. And I just would like to highlight three contentious issues on which we will definitely come back uh, today. The question of market access with a number of sectors of the Chinese economy, which were still very much closed to European investments on the one side, but also the other way around. I mean, a very high politicization of Chinese investments in Europe, in particular, when thinking of high profile investments in the context of the Belt and Road Initiative, not even to mention Huawei and investment in the European digital uh, infrastructure, politicization of foreign investments, which has also led in a certain way to the establishment of screening mechanisms, in foreign investment screening mechanisms, which is definitely another issue which we are likely to discuss today. So market access first, but also definitely the question of dispute resolution, with China having adopted in recent year a cautious approach towards ISDS on the one side, and the EU being very committed to reform traditional ISDS by promoting its investor, its investor court system on the one side, but also by promoting a multilateral investment court. Last but not least, there, is, there was also the question of the scope of the agreement and the question of the extent to which non-investment related provisions shall be included in the agreement. Provisions in terms of the protection of labor rights, protection of sustainability, protection of human rights. These were among the many contentious issues which had been discussed. As Julien mentioned it, the agreement has now only been concluded in principle. So there are still a number of elements which will need to be fine tuned, not least indeed in view of the process of ratification, which is likely to prove more or less difficult, depending on the ways in which the debates will evolve in the context of the Council of the EU on the one side, or and the European Parliament on the other. So this is what I think the two of us wanted to tell you in terms of this very brief introduction. And now I think without further ado, it is now time to move to our uh, introductory remarks by uh, Professor Jean-Christophe de Freyne, who is joining us from the uh, Catholic University of uh, Louvain-la-Neuve. 
Uh, Professor Dufresne is a specialist in uh, international political economy and European political economy. So when you organize an event with lawyers, it's always good to start with an economist uh, to set the tone, so to speak. So uh, Professor Dufresne is a specialist of, uh, in the study of comparative uh, regional integration processes and has worked extensively on the transformation of the Chinese economy as well as its effects on Europe. Um, Jean-Christophe will give us a presentation on the current state of the investment relationship between the European Union and China. Um, so Jean-Christophe, many thanks for having accepted our invitation and you now have the floor for 12 minutes. Thank you very much, Mathieu. Um, so I apologize already because I'm not a legal expert at all. I made my bachelor in law a few years ago, so I will really speak, as Mathieu mentioned, as an economist. I will try to recontextualize uh, the current agreement uh, to show first how it fits into the flurry of bilateral agreements that we have seen these last three decades in the world economy, but also it fits in the EU trade diplomacy and the Chinese trade diplomacy. So, Let's go back a, a, a bit to the development of such uh, bilateral trade agreements. In the WTO system, this is something quite recent. I mean, we if you look at the WTO website, you can see the number of bilateral agreements that have been signed over the decades. But there is a quick acceleration in the 1990s. Uh, of course, you had the EEC, uh, the Treaty of Rome, that was made in, in 57, so that was the first one, and, and you had few other bilateral agreements. But the one notified to the GATT and then to the WTO using Article 24 began literally to explode in the 1990s. Now, there were structural reasons for that. One was the fact that a lot of developing economies were opening to international trade and international FDI to create export platform and try to somehow insert themselves in global value chain, trying to imitate a bit what the East Asian tiger had done earlier. So suddenly you begin to have countries like Turkey, like Eastern Europe, Mexico, we had the creation of NAFTA, the creation of the custom union between the EU and Mexico. We had economic partnership agreement between Japan and its uh, uh, Asian partners. All of that helped actually to organize international production networks, international global value chain that were often controlled by multinationals from the United States from Europe and from Japan. And we've seen a regional integration taking place in East Asia with a lot of bilateral investment and trade agreement between Japan and its neighbors. We've seen that in the neighborhood of Europe with North Africa, Turkey, but of course the enlargement towards Eastern Europe. We've seen that with NAFTA. And you had also a phenomenal of imitation, uh, the fact that the EU created a single market and courage other parts of the world like Mercosur, ASEAN, to develop their own free trade or common market area in the time. There was also another element which is interesting to, to see is that don't forget that the rise of these bilateral agreements took place at the same time as the Uruguay round, 1986-1994, and was often also a strategy of some of the main actors, notably the US or the EU or Japan, to improve their bargaining position in this negotiation. If you had a lot of bilateral agreements or bilateral negotiation, you stood stronger in this negotiation. However, the Uruguay round had a lot of tension in the beginning, but eventually it was very successful with the Marrakesh Agreement in 1994, which set the, the, the rise of the WTO. And I would say that it seems that it was possible to reach major multilateral reform at the multilateral level. And that was, of course, the development of the TRIPS, the TRIMS, uh, the, uh, the trade uh, intellectual property aspects, the trade uh, investment um, measures. And you had, of course, the GATS, the extension of the GATS, and the creation of the WTO. 
when the WTO was created, the big expectation was that we could continue to develop such advanced into multilateral liberalization with the Singapore issues that were developed at the Interministerial Conference of Singapore in 1996, which already set an agenda of further global governance rules on trade by including uh, trade facilitation measures, even competition measures, developing further the trips, um, and uh, having an access to procurement. But then something began to happen. You begin to have an opposition to these Singapore issues and, the, and, and them setting up at the agenda. And we had already a problem to make the CETL uh, conference move forward in 1999, the million, uh, millennium round, because India would not accept these Singapore issues to be discussed at the WTO level so easily. And then you begin to have a coalition of emerging economies that were going stronger. They were going stronger notably because the price of commodities were very high, because also they had adopted a, a more uh, a trade policy that generated more uh, surplus. So they were not in the difficulties of the debt crisis of the 1980s that characterized the situation of developing countries during the Uruguay round. When the Doha round in 2001 was launched, many developing economies had very strong trade surplus. They didn't have debt problems. They were growing faster than many developed economies and therefore their share in the world economy and the world trade was increasing very fast. The fact that many of these emerging economies begin to have not only be part of international production network like China, like, like India, like Turkey and others, um, they begin to be more efficient to oppose the agenda of liberalization of the US and the EU, and to a lesser extent Japan, who wanted to go further into accessing markets, procurements, uh, having more competition rules. And indeed, I mean, while in 1989, the economist Williamson talked about the Washington consensus saying that most of the Latin America and Eastern European economies would abide by a limited role of the state, a non-developmentalist state, a state that would accept to open uh, totally the economy to foreign uh, direct investment and to trade, these begin to be contested in the 2000s. Some people talk about the Beijing consensus, which is not, of course, totally correct because there was not such a policy never designed by, by the, the, the Chinese who never claimed to have a model for the rest of the world. But nevertheless, the idea is that you had no a group of emerging economies who wanted to have a developmentalist view of the state. They could, of course, build themselves on some theoretical framework or, or articles in economies to begin to challenge the Washington consensus, like Danny Rodrik or uh, the, the, the Korean economist uh, Ai Chun Chang which began to challenge the Washington consensus and show that actually to catch up, emerging economies had to develop industrial policy, which meant some limitation about the degree of liberalization, uh, a capacity for the state to subsidize his industry, to protect his industry, this infant industry at least, to limit uh, investment into strategic sectors and to have a much more interventionist view of the state. And of course, China was one of the main defender of this position, but he managed, China also managed to build a coalition of countries that was the famous BRICS association that you had, which had many difficulties to find a common position due to the differences. But clearly that was a first major different view than the Washington consensus and the agenda that the EU and the US wanted to impose at the bilateral level. When the United States begin to realize that you had a kind of opposition to this, their agenda uh, in 2003 at the Cancun WTO conference, 
uh, Robert Zelik, who was uh, the representative for US trade, began to say, okay, well, uh, we're blocked here in the process of negotiation. So we will go for, he used a term, the economist uh, Bergstein took, um, what he called, we will go for economic uh, trade uh, uh, competitive liberalization. That is, we will go for bilateral deals we will isolate the BRICS and in a certain way, uh, well, that, that will be our strategies to go around and impose our trade agenda of liberalization to the developing countries who want to do that. And indeed the US started bilateral agreements with Morocco, with Chile, with Peru, with uh, South Korea, and the EU followed doing almost the same uh, one or two years after. And you had a flurry of bilateral agreements and of course Japan extended its, its bilateral agreement as well, and you begin to have a competitive liberalization taking place. Nevertheless, the, the, even China, of course, was not totally absent and, and continued to develop the China-ASEAN uh, agreement. Although China was far less advanced in this type of advanced trade diplomacy, what happened is that it was probably not seen as sufficient by the US administration. There were some bilateral agreements, but they were limited. When the crisis of 2008 emerged, the Washington political elites became really worried about the fact that China was catching up. I mean, China was having a very high growth rate. No people were aware that before 2050, the Chinese GDP would be bigger. By the 2010, the World Bank estimates show that China was going to be the biggest trading power of the world, even though it was far less developed than the US and the GDP per capita was very low in terms of size of the world in the world economy, China was being seen as the only potential challenger to US hegemony in the 21st century. And so I would say that the US presidency under Obama developed a, a different strategy, a more ambitious one of bilateral agreements. So they developed uh, the, in 2012 at the State of the Union, Obama proposed the transatlantic uh, agreement, the TTIP with the, United, with the European Union. And at the same time, a few months later, he proposed to the Prime Minister of Japan to let Japan embark on the TPP. And so Obama had a strategy of isolating the BRICS and notably China by making these two bilateral agreements. And it was not even hidden. Huh? Commissioner Carol de Gucht of the EU, Commissioner for Trade at that time, the negotiating the TTIP said that one of the big advantage of the TTIP was not so much to open more the US market because it's already very open to Chinese, to US, EU trade and investors, but to set common transatlantic trade standards, technical standards that would discipline country like China. And I, I quote uh, Carol de Gucht at that time. The reaction of China to this, I would say, um, contain, trade containment strategy was to develop its own BRI initiative, which came a few months later, actually, probably as a response to this American initiative. It's difficult to say, but it comes exactly a few months after the uh, proposal of, of Obama. And of course, TTIP, if you look at it, is not a trade agreement, but it is a system of providing infrastructure to facilitate trade flows de facto, not de jure, not without a legal framework, but actually facilitate integration and access to Chinese product and facilitate a transit of product to Europe and accessing some key raw materials for the Chinese economy. And I would say we, we are actually seeing uh, this very strong confrontation you know, between these two strategies of the US and China. Uh, and somewhere, of course, the, the EU has been affected by the two because there's still talk of doing a, a transatlantic deal. And of course you have BRI that now includes EU uh, members. At the same time, the EU begin to have more problem with China. Can I have still three minutes, Mathieu? Two and a half max. Okay. Thank you. So I think that 
the big problem also that came up in terms of organizing uh, uh, the relations between China and the EU is that when China accessed the WTO in 2001, the EU were very a bit. In 2003, they called the EU a strategic partner and they thought that they still had problems to access some of the sectors of the Chinese market. They had problems of intellectual property protection, but nevertheless, they were very optimistic. By the 2010, things have changed. They've seen that actually the size of the public sector, especially in the big national champion in industry was still very big. That the uh, SASAC, uh, the of the State Council was still developing a, a very active industrial policy and that China was actually not moving towards a total liberalization in the EU model. That is the role of the state and industrial policy would remain very important. The second thing is that China developed a going global strategy that generated Chinese multinationals who begin to emerge on international market and begin to operate in Europe. And at the beginning, it was very limited. You had TCL who took over the French top song television, not very important, but progressively, Jelly took over Volvo. And then when it came to Sagenta being taken by the big Chinese chemical champion, when it was KUKA taken over by Midea in robotics, the European became increasingly worried about strategic asset seeking FDI that was taking over strategic assets. And they became, as Matthew mentioned, much more um, assertive and created a screening mechanism, although it's not legally binding, but it is still a very significant step. And they began to label China as a systemic rival, as China indeed as a different model of trade policy and a different model of the role of the state in the economic development. And that is here to stay. And I believe this is the main reason of the tension that you have between the EU and China and between the United States is this different vision of the state in the trade policy and the economy. And in that sense, probably uh, something that, that the EU also change a bit, they, they, they were able to go behind their fears and continue to have this disagreement with China. They are two factors, I would say. First, of course, China is getting still one of the major market for European firms. Volkswagen is producing more car in China than in Germany. So of course, continuing to have agreement with China is essential and securing some market access is, is seen as essential for EU business. The second is probably the, the Trump effect. Uh, the Trump effect forced the EU to make a lot of bilateral agreements with Japan, making public declaration between Donald Tusk and Abe to restore multilateral and to continue liberalization against the Trump America first policy. They also developed agreement with Mexico, our partners of the US, and they relaunched the Mercosur negotiation. That is partly probably the effect of the crisis, but also of the Trump unilateral, unilateralist. And I believe that for the Chinese and the EU, it was important to reach this agreement before the Biden administration came to power because of that. So I'm sorry, I will stop here, but thank you, Mathieu, for having me let, but I'm trying here to show a bit the dynamic and the big picture behind, I would say, this latest development. Thank you, Mathieu. Thank you very much, uh, indeed, Jean-Christophe. And um, it was indeed very important, I think, to, to set the scene, indeed, from the perspective of international political economy and and not to forget the elephant in the room with the United States, which is likely also to be an actor to which we'll come back in the two uh, forthcoming uh, panels. Uh, so thank you very much uh, indeed, Professor De Freyne. And it's now uh, without further ado time to move to the uh, first panel, uh, which will be chaired by uh, Julien Chess. And just to remind all participants that you should feel free to use the chat and to write any questions you may have uh, on the chat also for the presentation of Professor Dufresne, and you may have the possibility to ask him questions uh, during the Q&A after the first panel. Thank you. Julien, the floor is yours. Thank you. So it's a pleasure for me to, to chair this session number one, which as you can see has been titled, EU and China investments, areas of convergence and divergence. So in short, in this session, we want to focus on the, the substantive rules of the CAI. 
Um, as all the speakers' profiles are available on the web and you're all connected, I'll, I'll keep my uh, introductory remarks as brief as possible. Let me just say that I'm going to follow the order of the program. The first speaker is uh, Pascal Kenes, will focus on uh, services, investments, and, and market access. While the second speaker, speaker Dr. Luang, will focus on state on enterprises. And the third speaker, Dr. Vaccaro Incisa, will review the, um, the key substantive standards that will apply to AU China investments. Let me just remind everyone that each speaker will have a maximum of 12 minutes uh, for, for his or her presentation. After the three presentations, our uh, two discussants to kick off the discussion and comment on the presentations. So we are lucky to have Dr. Chen Wei Wu from the Academia Sinica in Taipei and Professor Jose Luis de Chares Marques from the Institute of European Studies of Macau. Um, so they will discuss, that means they'll be commenting briefly for two, three, two or three minutes on the first, the second, or the three presentations as they want. And if they want, they can also bring in some, some additional perspectives um, to this uh, session one. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker uh, in this session one with Dr. Pascal Canis, who is the managing director of the European Services Forum based in Brussels. Pascal has been following the negotiations right from the very beginning, so he has a lot to share with you. Pascal, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Julien. <clears throat> Thank you and, and a good afternoon or good morning, everyone. I hope you can see the screen. Um, I'd like to uh, immediately go into my presentation, which is going to focus on the investment and, and services. Uh, well. <clears throat> so first, um, the CHI is an investment agreement. It has been concluded on principle on the 30th of December, but it is not an FTA. I think it is very important to emphasize on this. Uh, therefore, it does not focus on, on trading goods. It is not tackling the usual part of a reduction of tariff of um, NTBs, SPS, and all of those uh, goods related issue, goods of, uh, rules of origin. So only on investment. However, it is not yet an investment protection agreement because they have not yet finished to negotiate the protection part. So no ISDS, no IS, uh, no investment state uh, court, uh, investment court like the EU is suggesting. And I'm sure we're gonna come back to this later. It is not an investment protection and therefore it is essentially an investment market access agreement as it is of today. <clears throat> it is also important to understand that the CHI is the first agreement where China has been a, a, um, willing to take some binding market access for investment on so-called non-services sectors, i.e. which is taking all the economy into consideration, agriculture, aquaculture, fisheries, mining, querying, et cetera, and then all the list of manufacturing sectors. And indeed, uh, China has taken commitment, for instance, in the automotive sector or in the chemical sector. So it is not only for the services, but also for non-services sectors. It's the first time that China is going into that route. Finally, the agreement is rebalancing the opening of the services sectors in China, and therefore focusing essentially of China taking market access to European companies to do business in China, because the EU is already pretty much open and therefore the EU didn't have much to, to, to give to China. The fact that China has accepted to go into that road, usually the developing countries or, or so-called developing countries are asking the reverse. Here we have an, an uh, unbalanced agreement in the favor of the European Union for, for a first. I will first go into some statistics uh, and then go to the date detail of the agreement. It is not often appreciated that the EU uh, is of course a, a very big and largest exporter of services, but China is already also a very big one. It is already the fourth largest global exporter in services in the world. It used to be the third up to last year, but the UK now is out of the EU and therefore is, is, is becoming number three. Um, oops. If we look at the trading services for the EU 27 to China, we can see that only 20% is of export of services. The rest is, is being export of goods. And the other way around, when China exporting to the EU, 
only 8.2% of, uh, of their total trade to the EU is services, which is very, very weak. And if we look at the world average, the EU is exporting less in, in terms of percentage than the rest of the world with 32%. And even China is exporting less in the EU than in the rest of the world, which is really worrying. And therefore, a rebalancing is, of course, uh, more than welcome. And we hope this agreement will come into that. What uh, we look at the details of what are the export of the EU to China or, or the other way around, we can see that um, we used to export more less in, in travel and transport, but we export more to China, 22% instead of 17, 15, uh, 21 instead of 15. That is because we export less in other uh, services sectors. In particular, for instance, if you look we export only 2% of financial services, while worldwide average is 9%. And uh, you can see the rest of there, we use to export more uh, other business services uh, to the rest of the world than 22% only to China. So that is showing that uh, the structure of our export to the rest of the world compared to China is different because we don't have access simply for financial services, a very good example, to China as, it, as of yet. Moving from trading services to foreign direct investment, here you can see that the EU is the biggest global investor and second recipient of foreign direct investment in the world, but China is already becoming an uh, important um, investor into the world. It is already the third global investor uh, and recipient of FDI is the number fifth. And that is not taken in consideration FDI going to China. And as you know, many investments are going to China all through China, through the rest of the world for the legal security. If you add up these two, of course, China will come the double of that. So China is already very big into foreign direct investment. So we're going to look at whether this is true also between EU and China. Here you have the figures of the outward and inward uh, uh, foreign direct investment to the EU and from, from the EU to China and, and the other way around. The um, investment uh, has grown 45% in the last uh, five years or six years, and China outward has been growing by 192%, which is important, but they, first they started low, and it is starting to stagnate. And, and we don't have all the figures for the, for the other years, but we know that they, they have been stagnating further. So why are we complaining that actually some people were in Europe saying Europe will invade uh, China, Europe um, will be invaded by Chinese investment and SOEs? I don't think that the figures are going into that direction. However, it is true that these figures are, let's say controversial, and some people don't believe that these figures of stocks uh, that I have shown you from Eurostat are uh, reflecting the reality and the Rojong group, which is specializing to uh, uh, China, uh, is saying that actually investment from China to the EU is bigger than what we uh, have from the Eurostat. And instead of being, um, we're showing here for, uh, 59 billion euros, uh, it would be $141 billion, so it's a bit in, in different figures, but it's more than twice of what it would be. Okay, why not? For the EU side, apparently these figures are correct, so 130, 73 is more or less what we have in euros. But I think we should go um, higher than this and look at the, the, the evolution in a different way. How much and how big China investment to the EU is, and should we be concerned? and how much our investment from European Union to China is, and should we be happy or, or less happy. These figures you can see here is showing you that in 2015, outward in investment, in investment, outward investment to China represented only 2.4% of the total of the EU. And I look at the figures in 2018, it's only 2%. It has actually diminished in terms of share. If we look at the inward investment, from China to the EU, in 2015, it was 0.6%, and in 2018, it's 0.8%. And even if we would take the Rojo group, Rojo group and multiply that by two, it will be only less than 2%. So it's not big. And I think we have to admit that. And the reason why it is not big, it is not maybe uh, because it is not open, because of other reasons that maybe the agreement is going to try to, to settle down. I was looking at where these investments were going from. When we look at worldwide investment 
from the EU and to the EU, we can see that 58, let's say 60% of EU outward investment uh, were going into services and 87% of EU investment coming into the EU going into services sectors. And you can see the sectors here, they're not really the same classification that you would believe. So um, um, it's, it's a, a little bit more complicated than, than we think, but what would be the share of China into this? I was looking at where investment of the EU to China were going in terms of goods or services and where the investment from China to uh, the EU were going and into uh, services or goods. And very interestingly, you can see that when I was sh showing that 60% of normal investment outward from the EU to, to China, no, to the world, to the world is 60%. Here we have only 40%. And actually the evolution has not changed much. And I think this is a clear signal that investment to China by the European Union comp companies into the services sectors is very much difficult and cannot match what we do in the rest of the world. When you look at the other way around, I was showing that 87% of inward investment coming from the rest of the world to the EU was into services. Well, China in 2013 was only 28%. And very interestingly, in five years or six years time, you can see that China investment to the EU has adapted very much to the EU, EU um, uh, system and EU uh, um, happy to inc welcome foreign direct investment. 80% of all foreign investment coming from China to the EU were going into services. So that has been possible by the Chinese who adapted very much to the EU market because also the market is open, which is not the case the other way around. I'm going quickly to other figures uh, to um, show that we have um, investment into the different sectors. You can see that automotive uh, very much, but not much services sectors. I don't have much time, but uh, I, I guess the slides are gonna be available. Uh, when you look at the countries which are investing uh, in China, reflects in red, a lot of German foreign direct investment into China. And if you come back, you can see that the, the blue one here are into automotive. So you can see that there is a match between Germany and automotive. But let's go to the agreement. First, before the agreement, it is very important to uh, remember that China has adopted an autonomous reform by the foreign investment law, which came into practice into effect uh, on the 1st of January. And that law has many positive elements, such as the pre-establishment, elimination of joint ventures, etc. And this law uses a um, negative list. And, and, and that is very important that China has been willing to be more systematic, more transparent and using the negative list, what is not possible instead of what is possible. So this law also expands some investment opportunities to the whole territory of mainland China beyond the earlier pilot phase of the free trade zone. And that has been very important for the services sectors. But this law, of course, um, still need a lot of clarification. It's a bit complex and, and you have to go through it. But first of all, it is not binding and therefore it is a unilateral reform which can be changed at any time. So the interest of the investment of the EU-China um, uh, Comprehensive Agreement on Investment is that this agreement has incorporated many elements of this unilateral reform by China into an international treaty, into the CHI. And that is really important, and in particular because it has been accompanied by some obligations like level playing field, transparency, et cetera, where they can, and I guess we're going to talk about that later on. But in terms of market access, the major aspect of the CHI is binding and ratcheting all autonomous reform that China has undertaken since 2001, so since GATS. And I think that the binding part is very important. The ratcheting is also very important, i.e. if China is going to go further into autonomous reform or through an international agreement with another country, the EU will benefit automatically of this new openness. This agreement includes commitment taken by China uh, in other trading partners. We heard about the US phase one deal, but there is also the China, Australia, the RCEP, et cetera. And that has been also giving new market access opening. 
So I'm not going to go through all of these sectors, but this is showing you that in more, many services sectors, uh, the China has taken new commitment for, for services, financial services, health services, et cetera, business services, environmental services, also mobility of people going to the establishment. So the link between mode three and mode four of, of the gaps. To conclude, Chairman, maybe some words to say that the CHI is going beyond the market access part. And we will talk about that, I'm sure, about level playing field. So in terms of discipline for the state and enterprises is going to follow. Um, just after me, transparency of subsidies, very important to be, to, be uh, uh, to understand what it is about and what are the rules for China to be transparent. Uh, rules against forced labor transfer of technology, which is really important. That is part of the uh, performance requirement uh, prohibition, which are into the agreement. Um, the, state, the sustainable development chapter is really a must in all agreement that the EU is China with the rest of the world. And we will see that, of course, it will be uh, criticized, of course, is going to be fiercely debated in the uh, European Parliament by the human rights and the Hong Kong, the Uyghurs, etc. Uh, we hope, that nevertheless, the ratification will go through it. What we hear from the European Parliament uh, as of uh, today, and they had a first hearing, and I've been invited to go to the Parliament to also make a, 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 some, some hearing um, on, on their aspect, is that they hope that you will be able to adopt internal tools to uh, ensure the respect of fundamental rights, but that the EU will, should not take hostage, not sign the agreement, uh, because there are a lot of market access uh, uh, interest into this agreement, but of course you will have to put into place internally some, some rules to make sure that uh, the values of the European treaties are respected. Thank you very much. Uh, fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Pascal. Thank you for, for giving us a very insightful presentation. Questions, but I keep them for the Q&A. And I'd like to remind all those in attendance that uh, they should feel free to use the chat box to ask questions now. It's easier for, for us to collect the questions uh, now or during the presentation as opposed to wait uh, for the Q&A to start. So don't hesitate. All right, thanks again, Pascal. I'm delighted to introduce the next speaker, which is Dr. Lu Wang of um, the University of New South Wales in Sydney. So it's late evening for, for her. Because a very important uh, topic, which is the role of state on enterprises um, in the CAI. I say important because the treatment of SOEs was and might well remain one of the most contentious aspects of the. Uh, the treaty and its implementation. So, hand over to you, Lou. Thank you so much, Professor Chase, if I may say, because your work have inspired me in many ways. I'm just uh, so delighted to see you and other leading experts online today. Um, I'd like to thank you and Professor Benet for your very kind invitation and wonderful organization. It's my great honor to be part of this very um, topical, but also very stimulating discussions with very distinguished speakers looking at some key issues in the most important investment agreement between the world's two largest economies. So my presentation today is about state-owned enterprises, which is one of the outstanding issue in the easement relationship and the looming challenge for international investment regulation in general. Given the time, I will focus on two questions. First question is why do SOEs matter for the investment agreement negotiation between the EU and China? And second, what has been achieved in the comprehensive agreement on investment in relation to state-owned enterprises? So to answer my first question, I think it's useful to reflect on the EU-China investment relationship and its change over the past decade. Um, we know that the EU and China have been mutually complementary markets, but compared to um, trade, the amount of bilateral investment trade, uh, bilateral invest, uh, investment is relatively low. Um, for the EU, in contrast to the rapid growth of Chinese investment in the EU market, 
the EU's outward FDI in China remains relatively modest with respect to the size and the potential of Chinese economy. Despite China's efforts over the past decade to improve market access um, to the EU, they are not effective and sufficient to address the imbalance in um, foreign investment between the EU and China. At the same time, the EU has expressed concerns over the favorable treatment to state-owned enterprises and uh, other restrictions to the EU investors in China, which contribute to the asymmetry in respect of investment protection. So in this context, the EU aims to address these concerns in negotiating comprehensive agreements on investment, including using the uh, international legal instrument to discipline state-owned enterprises to ensure a level playing field for the EU investors. As regards investment, uh, inwards for investments from China, state-owned enterprises have traditionally dominated Chinese investment in Europe. According to the statistics of Fodium Group, the state-owned enterprises accounted for more than 70 percent of the total Chinese investment in Europe between 2010 and 2015. Um, another study carried out by the Europe, uh, European Commission identified some salient trends in the foreign uh, ownership of EU forms over the last 10 years, which includes, among others, the increase of investments from emerging economies such as China and the increased investment by state-owned enterprises. So these trends reflect a shift in or a change in the EU-China investment relationship and has um, given rise to concerns over Chinese investments and Chinese SOEs and has um, pr prompted uh, regulatory responses in the EU to address potential risks such as the establishment of um, an EU-wide framework for the screening of foreign investments uh, for protecting the EU's essential interest. While this um, FDI regime applied to both private and public enterprises from third countries, no one could deny the impact of Chinese SOEs. At the same time, um, the more defensive European policies and the changing regulatory environment within the EU are criticized by some foreign, uh, foreign investors and their home governments. And the major concern of the Chinese government is to address concerns over the tightening FDI control in some EU member states and at the EU level, and to ensure investment protections to Chinese investors and the investment in the EU. Um, therefore, I think state-owned enterprises is an important issue for both the EU and China in relation to protection and regulation. Unfortunately, the agreement in principle does not include investment protection, leaving the protections to Chinese SOEs in the EU somewhat unpredictable subject to the emerging FDI review mechanisms um, in the EU. Nonetheless, they um, comprehensive agreement uh, on investment contains um, substantial commitment to level playing field, including SOE disciplines. So now I will turn to the specific provisions on state-owned enterprises in the um, investment agreement. And my purpose is to highlight some salient features of the new uh, bilateral investment agreement approach to discipline state-owned enterprise behavior. To be clear, the um, comprehensive agreement uh, between the EU and China is not the first international agreement disciplining state-owned enterprises. We know that WTO regime provides rules such as obligations on subsidies and non-discrimination, um, trying to address the um, some trade distorting policies that may be directed at state enterprises. Also, the U.S. addresses state-owned enterprise um, behaviors in its trade agreements. And the uh, remarkable recent development on state-owned enterprise disciplines is perhaps the CPTPP, which contains um, a chapter of innovative norms on SOE disciplines. However, the, um, the investment agreement between China and the EU is the first agreement 
um, between the two economies to deliver on detailed obligations for the behavior of state-owned enterprises, which I think in itself um, a breakthrough for the two parties on international investment rulemaking, especially in respect of state-owned state -owned enterprises. Specific provisions on SOEs are primarily found in Article 3 based under Section 2 on investment liberalization combined with other rules prescribed under the investment agreement, I think um, the following three issues are of great significance and illustrate some innovations. The first issue is um, the definition. The investment agreement does not define the SOEs or state enterprises directly. Instead, uh, the the kind adopted term covered entities covering a broad defined category of state owned enterprises. The covered entities go beyond the majority ownership or um, the traditional control test contained in other free trade agreements, namely the control through majority ownership interest or the effective influence on appointment or decisions. Um, it also includes enterprises controlled by the state through minority ownership or legal title. Um, in addition, it designated monopolies or entities vested with special rights or privileges also subject to international obligations. The broad definition of covered entities remain in line with the due consideration of ownership and control in other free trade agreements, but it also includes interesting innovations to address anti-competitive concerns over other public or private entities design and that, uh, designed or authorized by the government with privileged or monopolistic positions in relevant markets. However, the broad use of SOE disciplines is subject to certain exceptions, including um, government procurement of goods or services, and the non-conforming measures listed in annexes. And it also excludes covered entities whose annual revenues derive from the commercial activities less than 200 million special drawing rights in any one of the three previous um, consecutive fiscal years. And it also excludes activities conducted in the exercise of governmental authorities uh, including for national defense or public security and non-commercial activities for public services, such as to um, support the development of poverty er uh, areas or to deal with the natural disasters. In addition, other exceptions to the whole section and also the non-conforming measures and exceptions are listed in the parties annexes would likely carve out considerable number of measures and sectors from international obligations. I think this is understandable as each party has different and special sensitivities that need to be protected and taken into account to balance the need for disciplining state-owned enterprises. But it is acknowledged that exceptions and carve outs may complicate the scope and application of SOE disciplines and cast out on the fair competition. Ultimately, I think the scope of obligations will depend on the annexes which have yet been published. Nonetheless, I'd like to highlight that the scope and exceptions reflect a unique approach of the kind to displaying state-owned enterprises, which focus on behaviors of covered entities, namely the commercial activities or in the access of um, commercial authorities rather than the identity in relation to state-owned or state-controlled. The second um, issue is about substantive obligations on SOE behaviors, including act in accordance with commercial consideration, non-discriminatory treatment, and transparency. Um, acting in accordance with commercial consideration is a core principle of competitive neutrality and has been incorporated in other agreements such as the CPTPP. This obligation on their kind is subject to commercial 
activities of covered entities and does not apply to situation of trading goods and to uh, supply uh, services other than through establishing um, in enterprises or operation of covered investment. In addition to this requirement, Article 2 of uh, Section pr uh, Section 1 pr uh, provides commercial consideration, um, including uh, the other factors that would normally be taken into account in the commercial decisions of an enterprises in the relevant business or industry that have profit based and disciplined by market forces. Compared to the com commercial consideration under the CPTPP, the CHI does not require that other factors are those taken into account in commercial decisions by privately owned enterprises. Instead, it focuses on factors that would normally be considered in commercial decisions of any enterprises that are profit-based and disciplined by market forces. Um, Article 17 of the GATT also targets uh, state enterprises discriminatory activities and link the national treatment obligations to the need for state trading enterprises to act solely in accordance with commercial consideration for its purchase or sales. Um, and given the, uh, the article, uh, Article 17 must be read in conjunction uh, the uh, the compatibility of state enterprises activities with commercial consideration will be addressed only when uh, discriminatory conduct is found. By contrast, acting in accordance with commercial consideration under the CHI appears a separate obligation on behaviors of covered entities unless the entity engaged in public service and not in consistent with non-discrimination. As regards the obligation on non-discriminatory treatment, the CHI requires states to ensure its covered entities not to discriminate the other parties' investors in purchase or uh, sales of goods or services. Such obligations on non-discriminatory treatment covers purchase and sales of goods or services and the comparator that are used to assess the treatment accorded by covered entities in respect of purchases of goods or services are like goods or like services supplied by the home parties, investors and entities or subject to in like, uh, in like situations in respect to sales of goods or services. Um, in addition, the CHI includes specific transparency rules for covered entities. Um, according to the CHI, a contracting party shall, upon request, share information about the operation of covered entities if its commercial activities have adversely affected the other party's interest under the uh, agreement's obligation. In addition, each party shall endeavor to ensure the covered entities respect international good practice of corporate governance and transparency. By contrast, the CPTPP provisions on transparency appears more ambitious, which combines a proactive diffusion of information with a request mechanism to obtain additional information. Um, it requires states to make publicly available a list of state-owned enterprises and to update the list and, and on an annual basis. And the request mechanism found in CPTPP allows contracting state to obtain additional information with respect to non-commercial assistance offered by state to its state-owned enterprises. Notably, the CHI contains specific rules on transparency of subsidies, which will fill the gap in WTO rules on sub subsidies related to goods. By imposing transparency obligations on subsidies related to services, in addition, a specific consultation procedure will apply if one party consider any subsidies may have a negative effect on its investment interest. While non-discriminatory treatment and transparency of covered entities are significant for addressing anti-competitive concerns, uh, and leveling the playing field. The CHI explicitly extends these obligations to regulatory authority 
Accordingly, regulatory authority of each party shall act in partiality in like circumstances to all enterprises, whether public or private, foreign or domestic, in a consistent and non-discriminatory manner with respect to the enforcement of its law and regulations, and also act independently from the enterprises regulated by itself. These rules on um, uh, regulatory authority will help to improve the level playing field between public and private companies. In fact, these obligations on regulatory authorities are in line with China's recent practice on FDI regulations, which should contribute to fairer competition on the market and have a favorable effect on investors' confidence. Last but not least, the issue on dispute resolution. The kind allows each party to resolve the dispute resolution mechanism contained in the agreement in case of breaching investment, liberalization commitment, and other obligations. And this should include SOE disciplines. Although the current uh, tax does not provide a uh, mechanism for investor state dispute settlement, the provisions on state to state dispute settlement and the Monetary mechanism at pre-litigation phase may apply to obligations on SOE behaviors. Um, as per uh, the Article 3 under Section 5, parties will continue negotiations on investment protection and investment dispute settlements within two years of the signature of this agreement. Um, I think um, it's, it will be interesting to see whether there are any other innovations on investment dispute settlement in relation to SOE disciplines. For the purpose of my presentation, I think what matters here is that the parties are binding by the international obligations on SOE disciplines under CHI. In addition, the dispute settlement mechanism under the current treaty tax is available for states to address their concerns over SOE behaviors and resolve disputes through consultation, mediation, and even arbitration. So to conclude, I think that the kind obligations on state enterprises is a breakthrough in rulemaking, especially for China, considering that it is the first time China commits to discipline SOEs and fire, uh, and fire competition in an international investment agreement. Um, and, and I also think that state owned enterprise disciplines in the CHI is a joint policy response to China, uh, response of China and the EU to the rising concerns over SOEs, which will likely have far reaching implications for future national and international investment lawmaking. This is not limited to SOE disciplines, but also other provisions on investment, liberalization, and dispute resolution. And from the perspective of development, the internationalization of state-owned enterprises reflects merely one of the ways in which the nature of cross-border investment and the structure of multinational enterprises involve. In the uh, last decade, SOE remains a significant player in many economies and has become a major global competitor in international investment arena. SOEs, especially those from developing and emerging economies, have attracted increasing attention due to its rapid growth in market power and substantial contribution to foreign direct investment flows. In the meantime, as a relevant, uh, relatively new type of foreign investors, um, they are also causing concerns in recipient economies regarding national security, the level playing field, the governance and transparency, and are promoting uh, and are prompting uh, the uh, recipient governance to develop domestic and international rules to discipline SOE behaviors and address possible risks. Um, so in this uh, sense, I think the CHI provides a useful, different, uh, a useful approach setting um, a different international templates on SOE disciplines um, between the two largest economies in international investment agreement. I think I will stop here. Thank you very much and to the discussions. All right, so Lou, on behalf of everyone here, I'd like to, to thank you very much for a most interesting presentation. We are a bit beyond schedule. 
but since it's a digital meeting uh, if need be we can we can create time and i feel a bit you know saying that as a as a central banker i might do some quantitative easing time policy uh, later today for now it's my pleasure to introduce our third speaker uh, for today, who is uh, Dr. Matteo Vaccaro in CISA. And who will look at investment standards in the CAI and still existing BITs, in fact. I size, the, I size this opportunity to mention that, that Matteo has published a, a monumental monograph on China's treaty policy and practice in investment law and arbitration. And you can see the wonderful background behind him. That's really a huge amount of excellent work. I had the chance to, to read it, and I'm glad to see the book finally uh, published. Matteo, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much for this kind presentation. I'd like to thank you and Matteo, of course, for having me here today. Now, let me just uh, switch to this. Is it working? Can you confirm? Yes, it's working. Thank you very much. So the well, uh, he first of all, I'd like also to um, answer the perhaps uh, inherent question of some is that how do you tie a specific topic such as this one on compensation limited to uh, sorry, I guess yes, limited to compensation due to expropriation to the areas of convergence and divergence uh, within the uh, CHI. I will try to do that by outlining a few aspects and reconnecting to certain elements. First of all, about the ISDS uh, treaty practice of China in regard especially to the limitations, to certain limitations. Then, of course, I will only skim through the economic dimension of this issue because it has been already uh, outlined by the earlier speakers. I will briefly also go through the case that we have on the grounds of the fact that, as we know, uh, the EU-China investment agreement so far not only doesn't contain any treatment of any expropriation provision as it is for most of the uh, usual substantive protection standards, but also as it is a typical feature in this respect also of China's treaty policy and practice when dealing with multilateral entities or organizations as it was ASEAN for instance or RCEP, uh, the previous BITs will stay in place, which means that since all but one or two, depending on how you count them, um, European members have a BIT with China, uh, these issues are here to stay. Um, the BITs are here to stay. And also the problems that certain of these BITs that are particularly old take with them. Now, to move straight on on the uh, what is that we're talking about? Of course, this very well learned, this very learned audience know that very well. But I just like to fix the image in the mind of everyone. Uh, this is actually taken from the earlier model BATs, at least those that exist according to Gallagher and Shan. And you see there, the wording is: if a dispute involving the amount of compensation for expropriation cannot be settled, then we go to arbitration. Uh, now. This uh, wording is uh, more or less that in 60 uh, BITs still in force uh, of, um, from the part of China. And um, uh, I'd like to focus quickly on a few of the issues that have emerged. As you see there, you have the verb. The case law has really dealt on the verb that has been employed when we're talking about relating compensation concerning expropriation or involving. These are the three main verbs in my article that I have the privilege to have as part of Julian Chess collection uh, in his handbook of international investment law. I actually do a detailed analysis of each and every BIT and they, I dissect the clauses in showing how exactly they are composed in order to determine objectively what is the treaty practice of the country there. Um, also, the other aspect that has been uh, dealt with by the case law is uh, whether the disputes are li limited to expropriation per se or the amount of compensation, which of course triggers different answers there possibly. Then of course the presence of not a fork in the road, that, as we know is a, is a typical trait of China, but it has not always been the case ultimately. And then of course the famous issue of the interaction between the ISDS clause and the MFN clause, which again after the definition of investment, now we have it here, uh, sorry, after the extent, you know, with regard to the um, extent of the SDS clause, of course, also in this case has come into play and much of debate. 
Now, here, I will just very quickly go through the fact that this is, we'd like to highlight, this is not a doctrinal disquisition, this is a, a, tree, a true thing, and is about terms of macroeconomics, but I can only, uh, since, uh, I mean, I can only complement the exhaustive presentation of Dr. Kernes. Um, we have it here, you see, I mean, this is the Chinese investment inflow into the outflow in the European Union. Uh, which has been declining a bit over the last few years, but the stock, of course, is increasing as a matter of absolute terms. This decline has been, uh, as it has also been pointed out in part earlier, uh, being uh, determined by the fact that both the investment, as, uh, as Dr. Wang said, is carried out in Europe mainly through SOEs, but then recently the Chinese government is uh, allow me just to say very quickly this way, uh, put them on a leash in terms of the outflow of Chinese capital and project outside of China. And then on the other side, of course, the European Union, as it has been pointed out by Professor De Fregne, uh, has been put in place several members under the guidance of the commission as well, these investment screening systems, which of course uh, are slowing down a number of operations. Now, the point being here that 70% of all Chinese FDIs in the EU go to the usual suspect, which are the EU G7 members. I don't want to contradict far from me, Professor Chess. As far as I know from last year, Italy actually received a couple of billion more than France, but the issue is open for debate and maybe the numbers have changed. Anyway, of course, this is just a matter of um, one billion more, one billion less. The point is that most of the investment is in this four. And the issue here is that why France and Germany do have modern BIT, with China, with proper investment and, and unrestrained investor state dispute settlement, the UK and Italy don't. Now, of course, with regard to looking at the numbers for the past, in light of the situation we're having in the EU, the UK, I believe it's important to take it into account, especially because those 45 billion of Chinese investment in the UK may have possibly been determined, at least in part, because of the membership of the UK in the EU. I'd like to see the trends over the next 10 or 20 years if they're going to change there. But uh, the UK and Italy have these very old BITs with China, which have causes very limiting inv investment to, sorry, limiting dispute settlement to dispute related to compensation in case of expropriation. Now, just very quickly to focus on the case of Italy, you see there, because the UK in this sense then is out of the story, you have it there, the, we have 17 billion. It is mostly tied to very sensitive or visible sectors. And we do know that when we don't have especially a dispute settlement clause that is unrestrained, this enhanced the roles of politics there. And we'll have to see exactly how this plays out. Now, this is just to show that the, the issue is there, is real. Wet because, uh, and it's still there and it will be there for the next few years. <clears throat> but it is also real, moving instead to our proper field, in terms of case law. Because here's the situation. We do have, of course, as a matter of simplification there, we do have already 15 concluded cases dealing exactly on this point. Uh, and there are new cases, by the way, already underway, most of them, by the way, uh, originating from Chinese uh, treaties. Now, while of course not all of this, not, not, not this, these are not dealing between EU and China per se, the issue that I want to highlight here is that the cases that are being highlighted right now, the red ones, well, orange ones, are those where the tribunal, this is a simplification, of course, I'm not looking at the, I cannot, I don't have the time to deal with the exact wording of the clauses, which may vary, of course, from case to case, sometimes they're actually the same and the decisions are still different. I will leave it to questions in case there are any there. But do we do have out of 15, eight decisions where tribunals declined jurisdictions, of course, the temptation of the investor well, their lawyers anyway, is that one to expand from these clauses in order to get indirect expropriation or possibly even more when you have a clause that talks about involving the amount of compensation due to expropriation. Of course, the answers of the tribunals in this respect also through the MFN reading have been different. This is the case where the tribunal declined to entertain any other claims than that that is purely in the clause. However, the green cases are those where you see, uh, are those where you have uh, the tribunals accepting to go through either an expansive reading of the clause or uh, the MFN in order to accept claims other than pure compensation due to expropriation. Now, the, one case, the cases that are being highlighted right now in red boxes are those 
where we have a Chinese treaty underlying an old Chinese treaties, of course. But again, there are 60 still out there, 58 to be correct. And uh, so there is still a lot of potential disputes there to be based on this. And the new cases, by the way, uh, that are coming up and that are not mentioned here, by the way, rely on treaties that are old, notwithstanding the fact that there are newer treaties out there. there we have a number of legal considerations to make that unfortunately I don't have the time to do right now. Point is, out of this picture, is to show that there is certainly an aspect of inconsistency in terms of output of the legal system here uh, with regard to these clauses. Now, this again is a simplification. And just to draw very quickly a few conclusion is that the first one there is that this is an issue, and of course these are conclusions that are drawn from the article that is in uh, Julien, um, Julien pardon, um, uh, the handbook of investment law, uh, this is an issue that was entirely unforeseen at the time of the, from, from the part of negotiators. I'm pretty sure nobody, actually, we do have a case where a negotiator came up and they said we had no idea that this would have come up. Uh, and then these uh, unforeseen inconsistency, let's say, it rests in the word of the Judge Greenwood, which was the chair of the Iran Tribunal, on the fundamental difference of views between the various arbitrators on the point. And on the point, me paraphrasing Judge Greenwood actually elaborating on it rests in the end on the vision that the arbitrators have of their mission within the international investment law and arbitration context. So if you have those people moving from, those are those excellent learn colleague moving from public international law perspective that they look first of all from unambiguous consent. And if they don't find it, they stop there. Those who move instead from international excellent colleague as well, but in international commercial arbitration, arbitration perspective, they look instead for the effet utile and to fix consent when they don't find it out there. Of course, these two visions determine in light of the clause that we discuss, also the differences in answers that we're having, they are at the root of that. But even in this divergence, we do have a consensus. And the consensus is that the MFN today it's granted that it covers ISDS. It can cover ISDS. The point is that if you read the decisions in the article that I'm here presenting in this way, I actually review all the publicly available case law, which is the one that, I, uh, that you've seen in the earlier slide. The logical path to say that ISDS is covered through MFN, may be covered through MFN, are entirely different. But let's just say that at the, the end result is unanimous there. The chief divergence, however, is the weighing of the context of the VAT and its object and purpose. Those tribunal declining jurisdiction rely on the textual element. You see there are three decisions that are Kaufman Kohler chairing, Greenwood chairing, and Tomka chairing. I per perhaps I think this is not a surprise. Uh, in the article, of course, because it's my personal policy, and I would like also to thank here Julien, uh, Julien to, to allow me to that, to that. I always like outline the name of the arbitrators, the name of the councils, and the name of the experts intervening, because in the end, there is an aspect there and I'm about to highlight. Those tribunal instead that, uh, that accepted jurisdiction rested on a teleological approach and relied on the provision scope, the idea that there is an ISDS, we need to put it to good use, and the VAT's object and purpose. This is done very well in Sanum, where, by the way, one of the three arbitrators is also a very established public international lawyer. It gets to be problematic, however, in some decisions, and that's, for instance, where possibly states are gets to be unhappy, when the teleological approach, the mission, gets to be, uh, instead of supporting the textual reading of the clause, gets to be an a priori statement, we are investment arbitrators, so we have a mission to solve this dispute. That gets to be problematic. You have it there in the reasoning of those three decisions. Now, no tribunal decided to have jurisdiction on both the text and the MFN, with except of one very problematic decision that rests, by the way, on a Chinese BIT of 2009. The decision is of 2009. Now, the issue here is that one, and I'm reconnecting here on the EU China investment agreement now, on the choice of arbitrators. Because if we look at my article, but anyway, if you look at this decision, you see that there is a web, a very tight web of repeated appointments in different position and double hatting. And this is what we have come to learn through the ASDS negotiation at Ancetro that the states don't like. Nobody really does. So where is that disagreement comes into 
uh, into this aspect? Well, in Annex 2, which is still empty, is the Code of Conduct for Arbitrators is under negotiations right now. But the point is that we do know what is the position on the, of the EU on the point through the FTA that have been recently um, concluded anyway, whether it's Singapore, Vietnam, Canada, uh, and other white papers published here and there. Point is that we do know what is the EU perspective of this multilateral investment court decide. And we do know also what is the position of China in light of what has been said in the position expressed in July 2019 on the, uh, the ancestral table for the ASDS reform, which pushes for transparency and, and a certain guarantees or modification of the system of appointment of the arbitrators, while of course retaining full confidentiality over mediation. That's an aspect that has still not been uh, dealt with in detail, I think. Now, if you wish to know more, allow me for the last time to uh, point it out there, please. Uh, I, you're absolutely welcome to check out uh, the, the book that is upcoming next month with Braille and that I've devoted to China's treaty policy and practice in international investment law and arbitration. I hope this was of interest. If there are questions, they're welcome. Thank you. Uh, super, Matteo. That was a great presentation as for the, the two other speakers. Uh, it's now time to hear our two discussions. So can I leave two or three minutes to first uh, Dr. Wu, and then two or three minutes to Professor Sharish Marquez to make comments or to ask questions um, to our three panelists. Chen Hui, do you want to start? Okay, do you hear me? We do hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, so uh, thank you for your invitation. I just want to uh, comment uh, or one uh, some qu a quick question. Um, a quick question for um, Pascal. You mentioned that uh, the fear for uh, China is uh, conquering Europe is a bit uh, over exaggerated. I wonder whether you have a concrete number of uh, uh, this kind of uh, investment, which is uh, mainly uh, seeking uh, strategic uh, asset in Europe, or those cases which is subject to uh, a security uh, screening mechanism, so that we could, we could verify whether the fear is uh, over exaggerated or not. And secondly, I want to uh, comment on the convergence of uh, investment law. We know that uh, national security has, be, or has long uh, history, either in US uh, BIT or BIT with, uh, conquered by Germany. So the, the reason why uh, FDI, uh, especially Chinese FDI is uh, alerting uh, not only the US but also European Union is that uh, it's due to uh, what uh, Meshu said, uh, the politicization, or we can also say uh, securitization of investment, which is uh, based uh, on Chinese uh, state capitalism. And here I want to point out is um, this uh, sec uh, national security screen uh, mechanism, it's not only adopt by US also or by EU. China nowadays, it also has its own uh, uh, investment uh, screen, uh, screen mechanism. So it's not only uh, EU or US would block, block uh, Chinese investment. China would also block uh, EU and uh, US uh, investment. And the third point I want to mention about the convergence is laser convergence it's a, it's, a, it's a big strength because there's a convergence between investment law and trade law. Normally we see uh, FTA com, uh, containing uh, investment chapter, chapter. Now we see a, a investment agreement containing some trade uh, elements, which can be seen uh, in the uh, subsidy issues, but also in the um, uh, technic uh, technical uh, forced technical transfer cases. So the EU and China, they had a consultation in the WTO forum on the force, force, 
uh, technical transfer. But in this context, EU uh, suspend the case in the WTO, try to feel, uh, fix out the problem with negotiation with China in the CAI. So the problem here is uh, if, if the EU cannot fix the problem in the WTO forum, is it uh, possible for EU to fix the issue uh, through bilateral negotiation and the dispute settlement mechanism they are in? And if we uh, put uh, this uh, trade element provisions into investment treaties, would there be some uh, RTA issues? If uh, this issue um, would it uh, have some trade problems? This is basically my ideas on these issues. So I try to quick, uh, very quick. Thank you, Julian. Uh, thanks to you, Chen Wei. Fantastic set of comments. I'm sure our three panelists will, will like to uh, to all or some. Let me now invite uh, Jose, who is in Macau, to join the conversation. And I'm sure that Jose, with his background and great expertise in, in geopolitics and Asian integration, will, will be able to to deliver another uh, set of very interesting comments. Hello. Thank yeah, you. Jose, we hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Perfect. First of all, thank you very much, uh, Julian, for inviting me to be part of this very, very interesting uh, event. Uh, I'm sure that uh, this will be the first discussion of many more because the, we are still on a very early stage of our developments. And we are still not having the two annexes that were supposed to be published sometime around the end of February and then or, or beginning of March. And so my first question to everyone, uh, to all the, uh, uh, the participants and the, the, the speakers, uh, of course, is uh, whether there is any particular reason that you can uh, uh, see uh, that is uh, taking this uh, annexes to be delayed. Eventually, is there any problem with the negotiations even within the EU member states and so on? So this is my, my, first, uh, my first question. My second is in regard to the, to the figures and the meaning of the figures, more, more than the figures themselves. Of course, uh, we know from uh, a long time that it's not very easy to uh, characterize or identify all the uh, investments either from from China or from whatever, whatever uh, any other third member or third country to the EU due to the rules and the, the use of the balance of payment principles and so on in terms of uh, the statistics uh, but uh, nevertheless, it seems like there is some kind of consensus that even including Hong Kong, that the uh, Chinese investment, uh, as, and I repeat, including Hong Kong to the EU would not be uh, maybe over four or five percent. Uh, I think this is a fair guess. And so my question is, uh, if there is uh, the, this kind of, uh, this level of investment, whether this constitutes, even if some of these investments are in sensitive sectors, some kind of threat to uh, EU member states, national security, or to EU uh, as a whole, in the sense, uh, in terms of security and, um, and, this, and uh, public security particularly. Uh, so this, the, the, the question that uh, comes with this is that, Although, uh, of course, I, uh, I think there is also a great uh, um, uh, consensus in the sense that in terms of uh, economic interest, this uh, investment, what we know of Kai up to now, uh, is more favorable to uh, uh, EU investors to China than Chinese investments to the EU in the sense, and I would like to stress that, that uh, it represents, I would say, a relative uh, inc uh, incremental advantage in the sense that China already has a very big access to the European market, but uh, European investment did not have the same in regard to China. So there is now a better condition, although as, uh, as the, uh, 
the main negotiator from the EU said uh, recently, not reciprocity. And I think the EU was not seeking reciprocity as well. So having said that, and since many of, uh, or some of the EU member, uh, member, members of the parliament, they, they, they state that for them, the red line would be, for instance, for them uh, to somehow uh, accept uh, to the, uh, the, the upset Kai, that uh, the red line would be, for instance, for China to uh, adapt uh, some of the ILO conventions, particularly that regarding forced labor. So, my, and that the EU would put uh, uh, even develop, of course, uh, in, uh, adding, for instance, the, 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 uh, the subsidy mechanism in terms of uh, having its own autonomous tools. So in terms of certainty and predictability, would an investor in China to the EU uh, have bigger predictability uh, and uh, in terms of uh, their investment, particularly SOEs uh, in the future, or that is something that is very questionable, okay? And last but not least, uh, just a very, very small uh, comment, uh, which I think that uh, altogether, and I, I, this, uh, this uh, investment agreement, uh, and has been said, uh, is, a, is an investment agreement. And maybe it's not more nor less than an investment agreement. So this is all I have to say. Uh, for now, thank you very much again. I think I already took more than I, I the, than the time that I should have. Uh, uh, just perfect, uh, Jose. Thank you very much. This is really a fantastic set of comments and questions. So, Log, I suggest that we do something very simple before you open up for Q and A. I think it would be good to come back to our three speakers um, in the same order as their, as their presentations, Pascal. Uh, Lou and Matteo and invite them to to reply to the discussions uh, questions or comment on the comments. Let me just ask you to do that in two minutes each so that we have still 10 minutes for for questions from the, the floor. All right. Can we start with Pascal for two minutes? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Julien. And thank you for the questions. Um, <clears throat> It's difficult to to look at the different strategic investment that have been coming into uh, the EU from China, but I think the, the 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 numbers have decreased, and we have heard big names. But what we it's more complicated to see. But but if you look at the different press in local in local newspapers, you can see that actually some Chinese companies which have invested into the EU are actually leaving the EU because they just discovered that it is a complicated market with difficult. Um, uh, regulations and labor law, etc. So that is that is a reality of business business reality, not not anything to see with with uh, politics. Now, yes, uh, we have now the new uh, EU uh, um, FDI screening regulation. Not all EU member states have yet a mechanism into place, but you rightly saw that indeed also China now has its own national security mechanism. Um, and I think this is this is perfectly perfectly normal. In any case, what we have to remember is that <clears throat> in the treaty saying this, and it is in in all EU treaties, you always have as a country the right to regulate. So this will always be in place, and you have always a general exception to national security. So we're just putting into a text something which exists, and this agreement is nothing different. Um, the EU internal tools that they want to put as a possibility to recalibrate if there is something that they believe is going to be, to be wrong. You have mentioned many of them. Of course, we have the FDI screening regulation. Now we have into the working, um, the paper, um, which is going to be a regulation on the subsidies, but the agreement, the CAI itself is already introducing subsidies and there is a specific annex on that and transparency on subsidies. And for the first time, I think it's one of the very first agreement we find this, there is also obligation about uh, transparency on, on rules on, on subsidies for the services sectors, because you have the WTO, which is ruling subsidies on, on, on manufacturing, but not on the services sectors. You have also, um, the traditional tools for um, 
the sustainable development where companies will have to abide by corporate social responsibilities, responsible business conduct, a new reg regulation in the making here, here in the EU about due diligence uh, for the supply chain. So all of that is our in in um, tools within the EU, which are very important. Also into the making um, international public procurement on in uh, instrument for the public procurement. That is also uh, an, a tool within you, which is which is going to be a, a set of, of all of those tools will allow the EU to do something. There is a very important agreement um, provision in the agreement, which is on the performance requirement uh, chapter, I think it's article three, where in there you have the, the prohibition of the countries to uh, have force transfer of technology. So that is into the agreement and because it is into the agreement, it's gonna be possible to, to monitor it in, in an easier way. Um, maybe quickly on the, on the question about um, why do we think that there is a delay into the publication of the annexes? Uh, I don't think there is a delay. It has always been uh, mentioned that it's gonna be somewhere um, in, in March. From my last information by the chief negotiator here is that it's, it's gonna be published very soon, if not this week, probably next week. I don't think it is a delay. And in particular, I think it's gonna be a premiere. It is actually a breach in what the EU policy is. And normally they do not publish the annexes or the, the schedule of commitments before the agreement is fully ratified. So they're gonna do that as an exception to their rules. And it's gonna be interesting to look at them, of course. Uh, but I think it is in, in the effort of doing these, um, these transparency exercise uh, as an example to the rest of the world. I, I think I stop here, thank you. Thank you, Pascal, and very, very important point you made on performance requirements. Thank you very much. Uh, Lou, your turn. All right, thank you very much, Julian. Thank you so much for all the comments and questions. I think the questions uh, on my presentation relates to the implications of the SOE disciplines under the CHI, and I, I think I will address that implications um, on the SOEs and also on the international investment law regime. Uh, in terms of the um, SOE disciplines provided under the CHI on SOEs, I think uh, we are uh, expected to uh, expecting the, uh, the positive developments in addressing uh, SOE behaviors in accordance with the international commitments or obligations made by China and it's uh, where and it's likely to see um, you know the 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 the, the development of the state-owned enterprises in the Chinese market to act in accordance with for example the commercial uh, considerations uh, but as I said in my presentation the, the ultimate effect of the effectiveness and efficiency of these SOE disciplines depends on the um, a number of uh, issues. For example, the 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 uh, exceptions to the reserve sectors and reserved ma ma measures that are likely to be listed in the non-conforming measures um, in the annexes. So I think. Um, this question is uh, will remain in the uh, in the future, and uh, um, and the, the the ultimate effect also depends on the implementations to material uh, materialize the um, SOE commitments um, by the government. Um, in terms to the SOE disciplines. Um, implications of the disciplines on international investment law regime, I think it uh, provides a very important um, template, international template for regulating SOEs at international level uh, as it has been achieved between the uh, two largest uh, world largest economies and it uh, represents a different approach to discipline SOEs compared to the provisions under the CPTPP. So, so um, it could be uh, a use for templates um, to 
to address the the SOE disciplines and uh, uh, will likely to affect the future investment uh, lawmaking. That's all for my. Uh, um, Thank you very much. Apps. Thank you. Back to you, Matteo. There you are. So um, I'd like to pick on the last question of, the, of uh, Professor De Salas Marquez because it possibly wraps them all and they will also take all the time that I have. Uh, is this an investment agreement after all? Uh, well, my answer in light is that it moves also uh, from the treaty practice, not much of the EU, which doesn't really, whatever, <laughs> from the treaty practice of China uh, is no. Uh, this is not what we are used to see and understand as an investment agreement. Uh, there is no uh, protect standard of substantive protection. There is no ISDS so far. And so, so far, it can hardly be called an investment agreement, meaning that has a meaningful connection with what we, with the other 2,000 and 700 and 100 we have around. Uh, it is uh, a test. It is a test for both parties in different levels, I'd say. Um, China, as it has often been the case, uh, like when it did its first FTA with Pakistan, where it simply put in there the copy-paste of its model treaty in investment protection, and then the second in 2008 with uh, uh, New Zealand, a small, the smallest of the OECD economies possibly, in order to negotiate things in order not to have bad consequences if anything went bad. Um, China is testing new ground, as it has been put forth by, uh, by Dr. Wang. Uh, I mean, this, this SOE regulation is quite original. Uh, and on the, the, same, the labor, as it has been put forth many times, this labor, labor discipline is particularly uh, innovative. But of course, we know that that is a push of the EU. Uh, and especially parliament, whatever, our architecture. On this, on the other aspect, we do have a commission that, uh, on our side, on the European Union, that it's also in light of the key figures that haven't changed between the, all the previous administration and the current administration, is bringing on its uh, agenda that has a medium term, I'd say, um, objective, that it's possibly delinked from uh, what the member states say, of course, not all of them, some member states are always uh, listen more carefully than others, perhaps, but the point is that there is an agenda there that is technocratic, to the, which is not an issue for me at all, but I just say there is an agenda that is possibly delinked from what the member states want or think. Let's just remember that when this started in 2013, um, China wanted to have an FTA, it was an interest in investment agreement, the EU wanted an, a traditional investment agreement, which China didn't want, then the EU position changed after a few years because of the number of, uh, of the mm, political developments in certain member states, but this is um, well, this, this, has, this has been on our part. Uh, so it, it has somehow been the EU who has been the difficult player in this one. And in this sense, China has shown remarkable spirit of flexibility, which is something that I point out in this thing, uh, because very often, uh, depending also on the trust on the counterparty, on the, on the other party in the negotiating table, China can accept things that um, go beyond or any way are new to its investment treaty policy and practice. I'll close it here. Excellent. Um, I see that we received uh, a number of questions via the chat box. So I propose to um, very quickly ask each of you one, two or three uh, questions. And again, I will invite Pascal, Lou and Matteo to, to address uh, all or some of these questions. So let me start with Pascal. There is a question in the chat box for you, Pascal. Um, simply saying, how do you see the CI interacting with previous discussions between EU, US, and Japan on SOE, excess capacity, transfer of technology, and the like? And if I may follow up on that, perhaps a slightly broader question could be um, whether the, the CAI uh, change or affect in any way, the WTO talks on subsidies and, and related issues. With uh, the CI mean that China is really willing to engage at WTO on, w on subsidies uh, negotiations. Uh, for uh, Lu Wang, 
there is a question very precise, which is, are there, are there any consequences that you can foresee arising from the commercial considerations commitments in the CAI for the Chinese SOEs? And if I may, Lu, I'd like to hear you on the, the new um, uh, foreign investment law in China, um, the new, sorry, the new national security rules that are now being framed in, in a new law. Um, I'd like to hear you briefly commenting on the meaning of this new regulation for foreign investors, including European investors. For Matteo, uh, there is a question which is um, uh, quite simple, but, but something very interesting. How do you see the future coexistence between this new CAI and the existing, and if I may say, old BITs? A second specific question for you, Matteo, is uh, with the state and enterprises from China can use ISDS under the existing BITs. That's it for now. So let's go back to Pascal. Thank you, Julien. Um, well, I don't. I don't think we can. We can make a link between what is happening in the CAI and the WTO discussion, either between EU, US, Japan um, on transfer of technology. Maybe the one on transfer of technology. China is testing what they can achieve with the EU to see whether it would be possible to transfer it. I think we have to remind also, as I said at the very beginning in my presentation, that China has already undertaken unilateral reform in which they have themselves agreed on, on limiting uh, transfer of technology, uh, so forced transfer of technology. So I think that that China is, is moving in that way. But I don't think we can we can expand more than that. Um, the SOEs on transparency, on, on subsidies um, to, to any other WTO circle. Um, I, I think uh, China is, is waiting, is seeing and waiting uh, what is going to happen into the WTO and, and the reform uh, with the new director general and how the US administration will behave. But I think it would be premature to, to take any conclusion out of this. And the overcapacity is certainly not part of this exercise either. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Your turn. Thank you, Julia, and the audience uh, question. And uh, in terms of the the the, the consequences uh, rising from the com commercial uh, consideration, um, I think I think the likely consequences is that the government uh, will you know promote the reforms uh, at the domestic level to. Uh, um, to promote the uh, to 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 achieve the uh, the international commitments on SOE behaviors, but I think um, it's also important to note the exceptions. As I said, that both uh, parties has carved out uh, certain areas and uh, certain sectors from the obligations, including the obligations on SOE behaviors. So I think uh, that's also as uh, uh, important parts that we need to take into account when when evaluate the the the, the impact of the the rules as a whole. In terms of your Julian of your questions on the um, the, the 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 Chinese new uh, in, um, legislation on national security, I think it reflects on uh, a common. Um, I think it, re it reflects on a rising trend in, in both developing and developed countries um, to address the rising concerns on national security and to protect um, essential interests um, to balance it with investment protections. And uh, that is uh, a new feature in investment uh, investment uh, regime at the national level and uh, I think um, I, th I, I, I think that is not an ideal way to address or to you know to 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 um, achieve the the sustainable development of foreign investment and it will result in you know a discouragement of foreign investments uh, to some extent and uh, obviously, uh, the um, 
it's likely that foreign investors uh, are subject to greater scrutiny. But uh, I think the, uh, the Chinese response to some extent is to respond to the, uh, the, the tightening uh, FDI regime at the EU level, as we see a three layer uh, framework on FDI reviews are emerging in the EU, including the FDI screening for national security and also reviews on, uh, uh, on competition and also reviews on foreign subsidies. So that is kind of policy response to the uh, rising protectionism or, or securitisms in some um, recipient countries or economies of the Chinese investment. Um, but I think um, we, that's another reason I think we need to pay more attention to on international investment lawmakings to, uh, to achieve uh, a, a, a proper balance between investment protection and investment uh, regulations because on a, mu on a mutually benefits approach and on bilateral uh, or multilateral negotiations. That's my prelim, uh, preliminary result on your question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lou. And just before, uh, Matteo, I know that Pascal wanted to add a, a word of comment on a ratification in SDS. Pascal. Thank you, Julien. Yes, I, I, I was thinking that the question would be coming in, but um, I wanted to, to mention to everyone because I, we're going to discuss about ASDS later. I think it is important to understand that uh, the fact that there is no investment protection part in the agreement as of yet will make it easier for ratification of the agreement. If that would not be the case, and if we would have the investment part into investment protection part into the agreement, we should not forget that not only the European Parliament has to ratify it, but also all the national uh, Parliament of the uh, of the member states, which is around forty national assemblies, and that is because in the uh, European Court of Justice opinion of twenty fifteen. Uh, about the competence and the exclusive competence of the European institutions. It, it was clearly said that when you have ISDS part or investment protection part of investment portfolio, it has, it is a mixed competence, it has to be adopted by all members of the, uh, by all different parliament. So I think it is important to keep that into mind because um, it, it's also going to uh, maybe avoid a delay into the ratification of the investment market access part. Thank you. Very important point, Pascal. Thank you. And you'll be the last one, Matteo. Here I am. And uh, well, since we're talking about the opinion on uh, with between the EU and Singapore FTA, in, in with regard to the first question on how do you see the coexistence between the, the new and the old BAT regime? First of all, there is right now no, no issue of coexistence because exactly the first one doesn't have anything to uh, to deal with investor state uh, in terms of dispute settlement or protection so far and so far and then the ratification so it's, we're talking about something that will happen maybe in years but um, uh, one of the um, there is no issue it is because uh, for instance the new cases that are filed uh, against China for instance do rely on older VATs when you have new ones for instance two of the cases Asia Fo, um, Asia Post and uh, Go Chin Son uh, rely on the 1985 Singapore China VAT when uh, you which has been terminated so we're talking about sense of causes and then there is another case where which is macro trading can't comment because I'm part of, uh, but let's just say that also that one relies on the 1988 Japan, um, China VAT, when you have in reality the trilateral agreement at least between China and Japan and South Korea. Uh, this case of South Korea is peculiar in itself because right now you have three overlapping regimes between China and uh, South Korea, also in terms of dispute settlement. So it's, um, there is no, this, while uh, Professor Shea says, deeply criticizes this in a recent, if I remember correctly, in a recent uh, perspective uh, from Columbia University in terms of the recept that is not bringing much clarity in terms of simplifying the noodle balls of investment treaty. Well, this seems something that so far at least China is per perfectly comfortable with. And well, not saying that this is good or bad, I'm just saying that this is what it is. 
or it looks to be so far. And then uh, with regard to the SOEs and the OBITs, well, uh, since we, they don't have any other instruments that what they will use in case, but since they are SOEs, um, and there is, of course, a tendency uh, to deal uh, at a political level to sort problems out. Um, and it has been already the case also with certain investments in Peru uh, and also one in Kenya, for instance, where the, the approach to solve disputes actually tends to avoid, as we know, uh, the actually ending up in the arbitration procedure or the triggering of uh, older or newer uh, investor state dispute settlement clauses. Uh, so even this one, even on this aspect, let's say, to make it short, that I, I, there is no particular issue actually of course they might even favor the use of uh, um, um, uh, not on a leash uh, regime as opposed to that one that may be uh, with the Kai but we need to see also how exactly will be uh, specified the regime when it will come out under the Kai because maybe there are provisions that may tend to supersede uh, certain aspects of the regime of the older BATs that is still I guess a possibility uh, one way or another. Thanks. Excellent, excellent. I truly enjoyed this uh, first uh, session, and I'm sure that's why uh, we, we still have more than 130 people in attendance. Uh, we took an extra, say, 10 minutes uh, on the program, so there is a bit of uh, quantitative easing, but, but careful is the end. Uh, I also see some questions um, for you, Pascal, Lou, and Matteo in the chat box. But I suggest that if you want, you can answer them by writing a little letter while we'll be starting the, the second session. So I'd like to, to thank again our speakers for the stimulating contribution. That's really very high level and it's very enjoyable to listen to you and, and discuss uh, these issues with you. Uh, fantastic time management too on your part, so congrats. Thanks also for the, the, to the participants for the valuable discussions and, and questions. So it's time to, to close this session one, back to London and back to Mathieu for the session number two. Many thanks, Julien, and many thanks indeed to all the speakers and discussions for what was a, a very good uh, first session. So it is now time to move to our second panel, I mean, whose title is to ISDS or not to ISDS. So the other question could have been, to ICS or not to ICS, and as we've seen it in the first session, I mean, indeed, the answer, the short answer is indeed that there is no ISDS, no ICS provision uh, in the agreement as it has been negotiated. So a big part of the debate will be having here, I guess, in the second session will relate to the prospects and challenges indeed for the months and years to come when the EU and China will indeed keep pursuing, I mean, the negotiation on an investment uh, protection uh, mechanism. So for this session, uh, we also have uh, um, uh, an, an outstanding set of uh, scholars and practitioners uh, will contribute uh, to this panel um, in, uh, in the order of the program. I mean, we'll have, first of all, uh, Dr. Adinda Sinaev uh, from the European Commission, will give us a presentation on the European approach towards ISDS reform. Then we'll move to uh, Beijing with uh, Professor Chi uh, Manjiao from the University of International Business and Economics. We'll make a presentation on the state of China's experience in ISDS before coming back uh, to the UK with Professor Du Ming from Durham University. Um, Professor Du will talk about China's approach towards ISDS reform. And indeed, uh, uh, last but not least, we'll have a presentation by Professor Chi Tong from uh, the University of Wuhan. Uh, we'll focus on the issues around ISDS in the context of the Comprehensive Agreement on Investment. Uh, the kind of format for the second panel will be uh, similar to our first panel, namely each and every speaker will have a maximum of 12 uh, minutes for his or her presentation, and then the four presentations will be followed uh, by a short uh, discussion. And here we also have two excellent uh, discussions with Professor Lee Ewen from uh, the Erasmus University Rotterdam, and also my colleague, uh, Dr. Daniel Ben from uh, Queen Mary University uh, School of Law. So I would suggest that we start indeed with our first presentation on the European approach towards uh, ISDS reform. And for that, we'll have the pleasure to listen to Dr. Adinda Sinaev, who is currently working as a senior expert 
in DG Trade of the European Commission. Uh, Dr. Sinaev, I mean, has been working uh, uh, since 2014 as a legal expert in charge of dispute settlement and legal aspects of trade policy. And she's been in particular in charge of the negotiation of the investment dispute settlement policy in the context of the negotiations with China. So needless to say that we have here the right speaker to talk indeed about the European approach towards ISDS reform. Uh, Dr. Sinait, many thanks for being with us and the floor is yours for the coming 12 minutes. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here and to be able to participate in this event and to present the EU approach to ISDS reform. Of course, with the usual disclaimer, what I'm saying is uh, my own views, not necessarily those of the European Commission. I will use um, as a background a PowerPoint presentation, which I hope you can see. Does that work? Uh, not, not yet. No. Does it work now? Um, I cannot see anything on my screen, so I think it doesn't. Do you have the share screen button at the? Uh, yeah, the, the, at the, the green button? one. I clicked on the share screen. Uh, let me try. Um, Otherwise, I will just. Uh, yeah, it's strange. Please, if you want to start, and, and what I'll do is that I'll try, you send me your slides, so I will try yeah. to upload them myself and to share my screen, OK? OK, it's strange, because we tried it out. And it's, OK, um, so now, starting with um, the EU approach on ISDS reform. Now, some of you might be disappointed because contrary to the original intention of this program, today we will not be able to really discuss investment dispute settlement in CHI because as you will have seen, uh, the current CHI agreement does not cover investment dispute settlement or investment protection. We still call it an investment agreement, but an investment liberalization agreement. It is, its scope is mainly investment liberalization and some accompanying level playing field issues. But this may change because as you may also have seen, negotiations will continue on investment, on investment protection and on investment dispute settlement. And I will come back to that later. So you therefore- You should normally see your slides now. Sorry it, to interrupt. So just tell it, me whenever you want me to change to the next one. Yes, thank you. Um, Let's go to the next one. It, it still makes a lot of sense, I think, to um, look at the EU approach to ISDS reform, because our approach will still be relevant for the now starting negotiations uh, on investment protection and investment dispute settlement with, with China, but also with other countries and uh, in ANSI-TRAL. Um, now, on the background of the and the history of the EU approach, I think I can be very brief. Uh, you are all experts and you know the surrounding controversy era, uh, on ISDS and the criticism that was fueled by some controversial cases like Philip Morris, Vattenfall, and also the TTIP negotiations at the time. Um, faced with such developments, um, maybe the next slide, uh, the EU was in, in a very short period of time forced to develop its own policy and I'm saying in a very short time, because indeed it's only since 2009 that the EU became competent for FDI. Before, um, FDI was member states policy. And we, have, we, we know that there are now over, I think, 1,300 BITs concluded by member states. Now, um, with this ISDS controversy, the Commission conducted a public consultation and presented its new policy already in 2015 with a proposal for what we call the investment court system. Um, next slide, please. This should reply, so this new policy should reply to the main concerns as they had been identified in um, the public consultation, but also in the public debates, namely 
the lack of independence and impartiality of party appointed arbitrators, um, the confidentiality, or as some would say, the secrecy of the proceedings, the lack of a proper review mechanism, and the lack of coherence also linked to the ad hoc nature of arbitration. Um, if you look at those concerns, they actually reveal a more fundamental debate. Um, what is the nature of ISDS? Is it private law more similar to commercial arbitration? Then you can say the system is basically fine. One can improve it, but there are no fundamental flaws. But if you consider that ISDS is closer to public law, public international law, then the concerns are indeed justified and the nature of the cases, which increasingly involves legislative action like environmental legislation, which is considered to be of public interest, of general interest, this changing nature also leads to changes in the way ISDS is looked upon now, not only by certain vocal NGOs, but also by governments, by public authorities, and by the public at large. Um, it's therefore not surprising, maybe we can look at the next slide, that the concerns that were raised in the public consultation um, around 2015 in the EU, that the same concerns come back in the discussions in ANSITRAL, where um, there is a reform process going on and where concerns have been identified largely overlapping with what the EU um, has experienced. Indeed, consistency and correctness, concerns about the decision makers, concerns about costs and duration. Now, if you look at them more closely, it becomes clear that those concerns are interrelated and they are systemic in our view. For example, the ad hoc nature of panels leads to more inconsistency and therefore also unpredictability. And the ad hoc nature of panels is also linked to concerns on independence. The double heading, we all know it. It, it also increases the cost and the duration. For example, you need time for, to select the arbitrators, which can take quite some time and be expensive. Um, if the concerns are systemic, and I'm coming to the next slide now, then the response also needs to be systemic. This means that in the EU's view, we need in the first place a permanent body with full-time adjudicators that meet high standards, not only quality standards, but also ethical standards in order to address the concerns on independence. And on top of that, an appeal mechanism is necessary to ensure consistency and correctness of the decisions. Such permanent structure can also reduce the concerns on the duration and on costs. You don't lose time with the selection of arbitrators. You don't have the same, let's say, incentives um, that can lead to adjudicators in, in, a, in arbitration to delay the proceedings or to, um, to, to, to prolong the, um, the, the, the whole proceedings because the, the incentives will change if the adjudicators have a permanent salary. And of course, um, our view is that the whole system must be fully transparent in order to ensure the legitimacy and also to create confidence in it. Um, next slide, please. This is reflected in the investment court system as the EU has developed it, which consists of two levels, a court of first instance and an appeal tribunal each deciding in divisions of three members, one from each country and a chair from a third country, which is nothing new that you also have in arbitration. But very important is also that um, those members of the court would be permanent and they would look at cases on an, that will be allocated on a random basis. So in other words, the parties cannot choose their judges. They will not know in advance who will decide their case. So more as we are as we know it from our domestic courts. The ICS is the new mechanism which the EU has negotiated in all its recent FTAs, as we see in the next slide. Um, in CETA, Vietnam, Singapore, Mexico. It is also proposed in ongoing negotiations with uh, Indonesia, with Chile, um, and of course in CAI, but we will come back to that. 
Um, and in parallel to that, the EU also promotes the development of a multilateral mechanism um, in, 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 the, in the negotiations in UNCITRAL. Um, it's clear, of course, um, as we see in the next slide, it's clear that a multilateral court is ultimately the better option than to have um, a number of separate bilateral courts as we have it now in the EU, not only in terms of costs, but also for reasons of consistency, the multilateral approach is preferable over the bilateral one. And therefore the current ICS mechanisms in the EU agreements already foresee that they can be replaced by a multilateral court if in future uh, we will have created such a multilateral court. Now, um, you may raise the question whether one could not address the concerns around ISDS by other means. Do we need the ICS or another permanent structure? Now, our answer would be that those other options, they can only bring incremental improvements, but they leave the fundamental problems unchanged. For example, a code of conduct or the use of rosters um, that may strengthen ethical rules, but it doesn't fix the built-in problems of consistency, of correctness, of wrong incentives for arbitrators, um, of double heading, cost diversity, um, which you always have with ad hoc party appointed arbitrators. So coming back to what I said about the concerns, if we agree that the problem is systemic, then the solution must also be systemic. Um, now, what does this mean finally for the CHI negotiations? As I mentioned earlier, CHI is not finished. We have concluded the investment liberalization agreement, um, or at least finished the negotiations. We are now doing the legal scrubbing. But negotiations will go on, and this is even explicitly said in an article in CHI, which provides that China and the EU agree to continue negotiations on investment protection and on investment dispute settlements, taking into account the progress on structural reform in the context of UNCITRAL. So there is an explicit reference also to the multilateral negotiations in UNCITRAL. And the objective is to finish those negotiations within two years after signature. So it could be something like, um, depending on the date of signature, it could be uh, 2024, depending on how quickly we, we, we manage to finish it, uh, the, 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 the signature, it could also be a bit earlier, but that depends. Now those future negotiations, they do not start from scratch, maybe, can look at the next slide. Um, as, as it is already explicitly mentioned in CHI, they will be based on the progress already made. And indeed, substantial progress was already made also on investment dispute settlements. Um, it's not that China and the EU are totally apart. We have a lot of common ground. And uh, there are in any investment dispute settlement uh, chapter, there will be a number of common provisions, like an article on consultations, an article on submission of a claim. Those can in any way be negotiated and have already been discussed. Then on top of that, there, are an, there, there was already common ground between China and the EU on other issues that need to be addressed and where we both um, share that, the, the view that we need a reform. For example, we both agree that we need to deal with frivolous claims, that we need to deal with parallel claims, with circumvention, with third party funding. These are all issues that have already been discussed. Um, then, for example, if you look at China's submission to the UNCITRAL, it makes clear that China is in favor of an appeal mechanism. So also there, there is um, common ground, at least in the approach. Now, what is still open, and needs to be discussed is the ICS, or you can say the form a bilateral reformed ISDS mechanism can take while at the same time we work on a multilateral reform. And that is the task which we will have for our negotiation, negotiations in, in, in the next years. And I hope and I'm confident that we will be able to bring this to a successful outcome. Thank you. 
Many thanks, uh, Dr. Sinai, for this very comprehensive, I mean, uh, presentation, not only reminding, reminding us all of the concerns the US and EU member states have had uh, towards traditional ISDS, but also presenting the uh, uh, EU approach towards uh, addressing those shortcomings at both bilateral and multilateral level. Uh, now, I would say let's turn to the uh, Chinese perspective and indeed to Professor Chi uh, Manjiao. Um, to make a present, we'll make a presentation on the state of China's experience uh, in ISDS. Uh, professor Chi is a full professor and founding director of the Center for International Economic Law and Policy at the University of uh, International Business and Economics uh, in Beijing. Uh, professor Chi, the floor is yours for the coming 12 minutes. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, uh, Julian. Thank you for the um, kind invitation. Um, the topic assigned to me is uh, the state of uh, China's experience in ISDS. Well, uh, today we focus on uh, CAI, CAI, I, but I still think there are two major reasons why we still need to discuss the experience. First of all, as uh, Adinda has already mentioned and many uh, speakers have mentioned, the CAI does not have a part on ISDS. And therefore, uh, it is still possible, at least in theory, that the remaining 25 BITs between China and the member states of the European Union uh, could still be applied if there is um, such a need by the um, investors. And the second is that um, uh, the two parties, China and the EU, will still uh, negotiate in on um, the ISDS issue. Um, well, I. I, I think um, uh, whichever form the ISDS will take, uh, either a, a multilateral court uh, for investment, or as um, China has elaborated in, in its um, uh, position paper submitted to ANCITRA, uh, that is an arbitration plus a, a WTO appellate body like appeal system, or any other uh, modified system as the two parties agree in the future, um, ISDS would be a, an important part for the a, economic relations between the two parties. And for these reasons, I think it is helpful that we start from the basic, um, that is the existing uh, status quo of the ISDS uh, involving China and Chinese investments. Uh, for the purpose of this uh, very presentation, I think there is no compelling need for me to uh, discuss in uh, very much detail of the existing cases. Uh, I would very, very briefly uh, highlight a few facts of the re existing cases. And up to today, um, um, uh, the publicly reported cases involving China or Chinese investors are uh, 17. Um, but due to the, uh, the limit of um, our transparency issues, we don't have all the information of all these cases. Um, and then it is possible that um, the, the actual number would be 16 or even 18 or something, but that doesn't really matter. Um, what really matters is that we see an increase of uh, cases relying on Chinese BITs in recent years, especially in the recent few years. And almost all cases except three of them are uh, actually um, um, in recent decade. Um, and the second point I would like to highlight with regard to the recent cases or the existing cases that all these cases involving uh, the administrative acts of local governments, especially um, uh, the local government's policies and acts with regard to land use right. And this is very important in China's urbanization process. And uh, the, the recent decade has seen a uh, great development in China's urbanization process and these issues have caused a lot of uh, discussions in China but then uh, what is reflected in ISDS is that we have quite a number of cases uh, that involve in land use right um, and then uh, another um, uh, point is the 
um, is that the existing cases, almost all of them rely on old generation uh, BITs. And for some of these cases, it is inevitable that they have to rely on these old generation BITs because the, I mean, the investor did not really have a choice. But in some other cases, few though, um, uh, the investor did have a choice. For example, in, in, in the recent case uh, between China and Korea, or um, um, it is possible that, that uh, the investor may select one of these three um, uh, Chinese uh, investment treaties between China and Korea, China, Korean BIT and the, the FTA uh, between China and Korea and the uh, trilateral investment treaty between China, Korea and Japan. Uh, at least in theory, it is possible for the investor to select one of these, but uh, the investor select the oldest one, the, the BIT. Uh, that is the uh, the case in, in, in other um, uh, situations. And one of the reasons I believe is that the newer generation of BITs uh, is modeled more uh, predominantly after the US model. Uh, therefore, there is uh, exception clauses which would um, actually limit uh, the possibility of uh, the investor to win the case. And also, uh, I believe another reason is um, because the old generation BITs BITs, despite is some of the BITs use the narrow wording of uh, uh, only uh, disputes relating to amount of compensation of expropriation can be submitted to arbitration. I think uh, it is still a really, um, uh, I would say, um, to some extent, it is quite clear that the parties may have some anticipation out of the existing uh, jurisprudence. Uh, Matteo has already um, uh, discussed in depth uh, how these uh, narrow um, uh, term is interpreted. And then it seems that uh, there is a kind of rule inside or out, uh, out of these uh, uh, existing cases. So uh, finally, let me focus a little bit on uh, what I think more in interesting for the purpose of this discussion. Um, um, first of all, I would like to, to draw your attention to the capacity building issue. Um, this issue uh, has, has been very, very uh, seldom discussed. Um, and the reason is because it's uh, not really a part of the, 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 the transparent uh, a policy. Um, well, it's not secretive, of course, but uh, you have to be a very close follower of the policies of uh, of China to get uh, to get to know uh, that. And the first of all, um, a few years ago, um, China, uh, the Ministry of Commerce in, in particular, uh, has adopted this kind of policy that is the law firm pool uh, policy, which basically means that the the uh, the, the ministry actually uh, invite, let's say, thirty or or 20 law firms, which are qualified law firms, both international law firms and Chinese law firms, and then put them in a pool. And then uh, when there is a dispute involving um, um, uh, Chinese BIT or against China, it is possible that uh, the, the government would choose from this pool uh, one or more um, law firms to, to represent China. Um, this pool is uh, changing. Uh, I'm not sure it's annually or biannually, but it is changing uh, as requested by, by the circumstances. Um, so uh, we, we do have this pool there. Um, and then um, another thing about the capacity building is that if we have a close look at the, uh, the representation of Chinese cases, we still see uh, the majority of these cases are actually represented by uh, former law firms. Uh, which I think China could have done a better, uh, a better work at, at, in this regard. Um, the thing is that um, uh, after so many years of WTO litigation, China has been engaged in. China seems to have uh, getting, um, um, uh, let's say, um, more confidence and more expertise uh, in this regard. But uh, that is, of course, true. But on the other side of the story is if we really have a close look at that, in only one WTO case, um, there is uh, China retain only one Chinese law firm, uh, no foreign law firm at all. But um, in ISDS cases, as far as, as we can see from public uh, 
information, uh, uh, almost all cases involving foreign law firms. And even in a recent case, uh, there was only Chinese law firm, uh, still uh, foreign lawyers uh, get involved. I'm not saying this is wrong. This is nothing wrong. Uh, what I want to say is that the capacity, capacity building for China, uh, for Chinese law firms, for the experts um, uh, are really, um, um, a, I would say, a long way to go. Um, and in recent years, um, China has also realized uh, the need uh, or the, the, the pressure that uh, there was a lack of, um, uh, of uh, qualified lawyers serving as arbitrators in, uh, in existing investment arbitration cases. Uh, but again, of course, I mean, it's not a, a one-sided uh, issue. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't mean that if China wants, it can uh, succeed in that. I mean, arbitrators has to be chosen by uh, the parties. So another issue uh, I would say is about ISDS reform. I understand uh, Professor Du will discuss this um, uh, a moment a moment later. Uh, but what I want to um, highlight here is that uh, an important issue that CAI Kai uh, does not have ISDS, and um, uh, the parties is, have agreed that they will negotiate on um, uh, on the dispute settlement in the future, and that means uh, the negotiation of the C AI, ISDS, or whatever, uh, will be uh, actually um, and uh, concurrently with the ongoing uh, investment state or uh, dispute settlement or ISDS uh, reform, especially um, uh, chaired by Ancitra Working Group 3. So uh, the dynamics uh, behind that is worth uh, close um, um, uh, Noting. So a final point I would like to raise is that a very recent e uh, phenomena in recent few years, um, uh, we see Chinese uh, leading Chinese arbitration institutions in Chinese way, we call it arbitration commissions. Uh, they are actually uh, very bravely started the ISDS adventure. I use the word adventure and the, uh, because uh, no one knows the future for, for them. And notably in 2017, uh, uh, CTAC, that's China International Economic and Trade Arbitration Commission, issued its uh, uh, investment uh, arbitration rules. Um, and then uh, in Beijing International Arbitration Center, uh, two years later in 1929, also issued its set of rules uh, catering exclusively to investment arbitration. And in Beijing uh, arbitration, uh, rules, investment arbitration rules, there is a very, very uh, clear set of appeal rules, which I believe would be probably the very first set of appeal rules uh, exclusively for uh, investment arbitration. Uh, but uh, of course, as we see up to the present, there is no uh, cases reported uh, that have been submitted to either CTAC or Beijing International Arbitration Center. Uh, of course, um, I, 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 uh, from a pragmatic perspective, I don't think uh, they have a big chance to have cases in the very recent future. Uh, but of course, I mean, uh, it is worth noting in the future how uh, the ISDS adventure of leading Chinese arbitration uh, institutions uh, would uh, uh, interact with China's position with regard to ISDS reform and uh, the uh, China's economic strategy, such as the implementation of the Belt and Road Initiative and going abroad broad system, uh, a broad strategy, uh, which would uh, possibly, I would say, uh, bring about certain cases uh, on based on contracts, that would be a possible uh, sources of case for uh, these Chinese arbitration institutions. So uh, I hope I have uh, uh, provided some new information with regard to the existing, uh, I would say, atypical experience of uh, uh, Chinese experience of ISDS. So for the sake of time, uh, I think I should stop here. So uh, back to you, Matthew. Thank you again. A, a huge thank you indeed, Manjiao, not only for this fantastic presentation, but also for very much sticking to uh, your time. Uh, uh, thanks very much indeed also for pointing towards this important issue of capacity building. 
which has been indeed extensively investigated regarding China's participation to the WTO dispute settlement mechanism, but indeed there is a whole field there when China's uh, practice uh, in the area of international investment law is concerned. So thank you very much. Um, it's now time to move on to our next speaker with Professor Du Ming. Uh, we'll talk about China's approach towards uh, ISDS uh, reform. Uh, professor Du is a professor in Chinese law and the director of the Center for Chinese Law and Policy at uh, Durham uh, Law School. Um, Ming, many thanks for being with us uh, this morning and the floor is yours. Uh, you are on mute, uh, you are on mute Ming, you have to unmute. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you very much for a kind introduction. And also, I would like to thank both you and also Julie, my good friend, for bringing me on board on this very timely and important event. Uh, and I also would like to thank my co-panelists, Dr. Sinov and Professor Chi, for giving us a fabulous presentation, which laid a very good foundation for further discussions. I also like, I look forward uh, to hearing uh, Professor uh, Chi's talk shortly. So I'm charged with talking about China's SDS approach, but after hearing both Dr. Sinov and Professor Chi's introduction, very fabulous, I'm uh, thinking, I'm trying to figure out where my contribution should be to, 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 to fit with what they have uh, introduced so far. So as both my uh, previous speakers have said, the, the, the CHI does not contain SDS uh, provisions, and both parties agree to further negotiate in, in the next two years. And as we can expect, in the further negotiation, the European Union will put on board uh, its investment uh, court system. And the real issue is how China will respond to this proposal. And I would like to make some wild speculations to see how China will respond and what the factors might be in play here and will help us shape uh, the uh, China thinking on responding to this uh, proposal. And the starting point to think about China's response is of course China's official statement. And uh, uh, both China and European Union have agreed that the common objectives in their negotiations is to work towards modernized protection standards and SDS mechanism. And I would highlight here, take into account the work undertaken in the context of ancestral on a multilateral investment court. So this is clearly one idea on the table and China needs to respond. It is important to note here that China prefers to see a multilateral consensus on the European Union's brainchild of a multilateral investment court. In other words, China has not decided yet uh, to jump on the European Union's investment court bandwagon. This open, to, this open attitude may be reinforced by China's recent uh, interest announced by President Xi Jinping uh, to join the CPTPP. As we all know, the SDS mechanism in CPTPP is quite different from CHI and uh, uh, for, 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 uh, from the European Union's idea of in more ambitious and more systemic uh, reform proposals. Nevertheless, I would argue, and this is my key theme for this presentation, is that China is a potential strong ally of the European Union in pushing for the SDS reform and broadly in line with the European Union's uh, permanent multilateral investment court idea. I would further uh, to support uh, my position here. Now, first, as we uh, pointed out, as my previous speakers pointed out, China submitted one SDS reform proposal to Ancestral back in 2019. And it's clear that sh China shares uh, many of the concerns all of us have been talking about for years, uh, like uh, lack of error correcting mechanism and lack of appeal uh, system, therefore lack of consistency, predictability, et cetera, we are all familiar with. Therefore, it's clear that China supports the idea of a permanent appeal body with the wider SDS mechanisms. Indeed, an appeal mechanism was envisaged in, the, in China, Australia, FTA uh, back four or five years ago, even though a substantial outcome emerged from that negotiations. Well, it is true that China's support for a permanent uh, petty body mechanism does not necessarily translate into China's support 
for the European Union's idea of a permanent two-tier multilateral uh, investment court system. For example, when it comes to appointment of the tribunal uh, adjudicators, the European Union clearly advocates for a standing mechanism as just Dr. Sinem uh, very nicely introduced. But China, in contrast, emphasizes party autonomy in selecting arbitrators, at least for the first instance tribunal. Uh, but nevertheless, two points need to be noted here. The first is to begin with, for the purpose of CHI, I'm not saying uh, negotiate, uh, negotiations are unstrue, but for the purpose of CHI, and China's preference for party autonomy uh, in appointing adjudicators in the first instance tribunal could easily be accommodated if the European Union's two-tier investment court system is adopted, as we've seen from Dr. Sinev's introduction is clearly China can appoint, can appoint its own uh, arbitrators. Um, it's an equal number of European Union and China also third party. Therefore, China's preference could easily be accommodated. That's not an issue. It may be an issue for a multilateral forum, but it's not necessarily an issue for the purpose of CHI. Moreover, also, there appears to be uh, many other areas of agreement. As Again, as Dr. Sinem has introduced, we have a lot of common grounds, and it's not, not necessarily everything from scratch. There's a lot of convergences to start from. So uh, second point I want to say is, it is a slightly different question whether China will support the European Union's permanent multilateral court proposal at the ancestral. It's a different question we are talking about here. For example, China has so far not indicated the support for the European Union's uh, proposal to establish a first instance multilateral court. At the same time, there's no reason for China to be against the idea of an appellate, uh, appellate mechanism uh, in a multilateral investment court. Well, my, I'm thinking if the European Union could take a little flexible here and take a so-called open architecture approach, for example, allowing parties to uh, use ad hoc arbitral tribunals, while at the same time only using an appeal mechanism uh, envisaged in the multilateral investment court, then it certainly uh, addressing China's concerns and accommodating China's preferences. Now, third point I want to highlight is China's approach to SDS in general is shaped by China's experience in SDS and of course further shaped by China's experience in international arbitration and litigation more broadly, not only think about SDS. As Professor uh, Chi has just uh, told us, uh, China so far has only very limited exposure to uh, SDS. And generally there are very few cases against China as a defending party, or even there are some cases they have only insignificant ramifications. Thus, China may not have the first hand experience uh, we call X the pen yet. Um, um, more broadly, uh, China experience in WTO litigation is another anchor for China to assess its approach to SDS. So, so far, China is very comfortable with WTO dispute settlement mechanism. In the future, uh, if the SDS can find uh, parallels and similarities with, SDS, with the WTO dispute settlement system, China may find it's familiar and therefore more willing to support. And of course, there's a reason for China to be uh, cautious. Um, in year 2000 alone, I'm aware there were at least three new cases against China, as a privilege I just mentioned very briefly. And Chinese new BITs and new foreign investment law afford foreign investors more rights and also more liberal SDS clauses. So it is possible that China will be involved in more and more uh, investment arbitrations in the future in which China needs to defend its uh, uh, administrative, uh, administrative decisions, in particular, as Professor Chi uh, has said, a lot of involving local uh, governments in, in terms of land use rights. So, uh, you know, different from WTO, which only provides prospective remedies, uh, and the a loss in investment arbitration is a totally different uh, story here. It involved diversion of public money, and more important for Chinese government, losing face. Uh, given China's status uh, as a capital exporting power and also uh, its ambitious uh, BRI, as our 
speakers have uh, highlighted, and China will not turn its back on SDS simply because losing one or two cases, uh, but China definitely wants to go slow and keeping close eye on what consensus uh, may be emerging from multilateral negotiations at Ancestral. Okay, let me briefly summarize. Uh, China has an interest in seeing SDS reform and keeps an open attitude towards what institutional uh, reform options will be, either a permanent multilateral investment court or a petty body system on top of exit, whatever it is, China is very open. But for the purpose of CHI, China is more likely to agree with the European Union's SDS reform proposal because of China's concerns and preferences could be easily accommodated. Uh, it is a different story of whether China will support the European Union's uh, permanent investment court idea and uh, multilateral follow. So it's two different questions. We need to separate them. Thank you, Matthew. That's, that's what I'm saying here. Yeah. <laughs> many thanks. Uh, many thanks indeed, Ming, uh, for uh, this excellent presentation and, and very nuanced analysis of China's cautious approach towards ISDS, but also what you've described as being China's open attitude uh, towards the reform of the overall uh, system. Uh, I think your, your presentation was a wonderful uh, transition for our, for our, our third uh, speaker uh, this morning, uh, Professor Chi Tong from uh, uh, Wuhan University. Professor Chi is a professor of international law in Wuhan and will address uh, this afternoon uh, the question of the issues around ISDS in the specific context of the Comprehensive Agreement on Investment. Uh, Professor Chi, the, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. We can at the moment not hear you, so I don't know if you are on mute, you are still on mute at the moment. Now, yeah, can you hear now me? We can, now we can hear you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Mazen. Thank you, Junior. Thank you for the invitation and organization of this webinar. Uh, so uh, I want to share my screen. Does it work? It works very well. Yes. OK, OK. As we all know, uh, the, U the EU and China uh, have committed to pursue the negotiation and investment dispute settlement uh, within two years of the signature of uh, the CAI. So it, this is not the first time uh, that an international economic agreement uh, leaves the ISDS mechanism for future discussion. Uh, my PowerPoint uh, will concentrate uh, on certain important issues uh, concerning ISDS, uh, which include uh, three aspects. Uh, some of it uh, was already uh, mentioned by uh, our former uh, uh, speakers. Um, so the first one is the path to the ISDS reform. <coughs> uh, we could find an interesting uh, uh, small difference uh, uh, between uh, the agreement in principle and the draft CAI. Uh, both of it uh, indicated the consensus uh, between the EU and China that the establishment of ISDS uh, mechanism and the CIA, uh, CAI uh, should take into account the work uh, undertaken in the context of uh, ancestral. Uh, but uh, uh, I find a very small difference uh, uh, between this, uh, the expre ex expression of these two documents. The former highlight a uh, multilateral investment court, uh, where the later only mentioned progress uh, on structural reform of international dispute settlement. Uh, so that's why uh, it's necessary to review the party's attitudes um, and the past uh, to the ISDS reform uh, during the, uh, uh, along the ancestral working uh, group three. Um, uh, so uh, from the 
from table one, uh, we could find uh, the main difference between EU and uh, China's position focus on how to establish, establish a multilateral adjudicatory institution uh, for ISDS. So in the view of EU, the uh, permanent uh, standing two ties uh, mechanism is the only suggested option that can successfully respond to all of the concerns identified in the working group through uh, th uh, third. And the EU has already adopted this reform option in its recent investment uh, uh, treaties with uh, uh, Canada, Singapore, Vietnam, and uh, Mexico. Uh, but in contrast, uh, China supported for a permanent uh, peer mechanism to resolve problems in the current ISDS uh, region. And uh, uh, we could find some examples, uh, uh, for example, in the China-Australia FTA, FTA which concluded in 2015, uh, which contains the provision uh, pertaining to the negotiation for a bilateral a pilot mechanism. So uh, as for the appointment of ISDS tribunal members, the EU advocates for a standing mechanism with the same body of uh, adjudicators appointed for long and the target terms. Uh, unlike the EU, China takes uh, more traditional positions, uh, holding that the right of party to appoint arbitrators at the first instance uh, stage, uh, which should be uh, retained in, the, in any reform pro process as an important aid uh, to enhancing the confidence of party to investment dispute. Uh, so far, uh, both the EU and China have shown their firmly and uh, clearly support on ISDS reform. Uh, to narrow the main differences between uh, EU and uh, China in the CAI negotiation, uh, I think a potential combinations of the reform options uh, which means the uh, MIC or an, a pilot uh, uh, mechanism may need to be explored further. Uh, we could uh, find uh, some other areas, uh, uh, potential convergence between uh, uh, these two parties, uh, which lays the foundation for the follow-up negotiation. Uh, firstly, the parties uh, show Shia uh, the ob uh, objective of strengthening uh, ethical rules uh, to avoid the conflict of interest for adjudicators. Uh, and secondly, with the aim of investment dispute prevention and mitigation, uh, both parties uh, propose to adopt uh, ADR measures. And uh, third, uh, uh, both EU and China support the stipulation of uh, transparency discipline for third party funding. So, uh, so the second, uh, the second point is, um, we could find according to article 15.1 of the CAI, uh, previous agreements between the member states of the uh, EU and China are not uh, superseded or terminate, terminated by the CAA. So it's not clear uh, whether this clause will be effective when the ISDS mechanism under the CAI, uh, CAI is available. So is there a coexistence uh, replacement or even conflict between the ISDS mechanism and the CAA and the previous uh, BIT. So if the latter is replaced, how to define disputes that can be submitted to the new mechanism? So as shown in the table two, uh, we could find there are uh, 
25 uh, uh, bilateral investment treaties uh, in force, concluded uh, by 26 member states of the EU. <clears throat> Most of them have ISDS uh, arrangement in a certain extent. <clears throat> So uh, the first choice uh, it seems most likely the ISDS mechanism and the CAI will replace the previous uh, ones and the BIT, uh, which is the most uh, commonly method to modernize the existing stock of old generation uh, investment agreements. So in this case, uh, uh, I think a transitional clause in the CAA may help to ensure a smooth transition from the old BIT to CAA, CAI. And uh, secondly, uh, it's possible that the CAI coexisted with the previous BIT, uh, like what the EU and the UK uh, trade and uh, cooperation agreement and the earlier bilateral agreement between the UK and the EU did. Uh, however, in this case, there is a risk uh, that the investor may be allowed to uh, cherry pick the most uh, uh, favorite collusion, uh, trade shopping between the CAI and an old uh, BIT, uh, thus uh, undermining the reform uh, efforts made through the CAI. And the third option is the uh, ISDS mechanism and the CAI and the previous uh, BI, uh, BIT may provide uh, conflicting remedies uh, for investors. So therefore, in this case, appropriate measures should be taken to avoid uh, uh, parallel uh, and multiple uh, proceedings, uh, such as uh, uh, the inclusion of an exclusive remedy clause. So uh, the third issue uh, is uh, about the compatibility of the ISDS mechanism and the CAI and with EU law. Uh, so there is uh, an inevitable question concerning the compatibility of ISDS mechanism and the CAI with the autonomy of the EU legal order and the fundamental rights. Uh, we could find a, a very important uh, uh, document uh, which may give us critical uh, uh, impl uh, implication can be uh, in the opinion 117 by the uh, CJU. Uh, according to its decision, uh, it seems uh, ISDS arrangement and uh, the CETA uh, is fully compatible with EU law from three aspects. Uh, uh, but it's worth noting that the CJEU's conclusion uh, that, uh, that the model guarantees the right of access to an independent court does not resolve whether traditional ISDS mechanisms, which are provided uh, from Older uh, agreements are compatible with the need to safeguard EU's fundamental rights and values. So, as a conclusion, it seems both the EU and China have incentives to negotiate the ISDS mechanism in both uh, directions, uh, balancing the investors' rights and the regulatory power. Of the host, uh, host uh, of the host states. Uh, uh, however, the negotiation may not be effortless. Uh, to conduct an effective negotiation on SDS, potential combination of the former uh, of the reform option need to be explored, and the relationship between the ISDS mechanism and the CAI and the previous uh, BIT could be clarified. And finally, the compatibility of ISDS mechanism and the CAI with EU now deserves further attention.
And uh, that's all for my presentations. Thank you very much. Many thanks uh, indeed, Tong, for this very interesting presentation. I think it was indeed kind of necessary to zoom on the actual uh, uh, treaties uh, between uh, EU member states and uh, China, but also indeed to interrogate, I mean, the implications of the comprehensive agreement on investment in terms of its implications for EU law. So many, many thanks indeed for that. Uh, it's now time for us to move on to our two uh, discussions. Uh, first of all, Professor Li Yuen, uh, who is a professor of Chinese law at Erasmus University Rotterdam, will be followed by uh, Dr. Daniel Bend, who is a, a senior lecturer in international investment practice at Queen Mary University School of Law. I just would like to remind our two discussions that they've been allocated around three minutes, I mean, uh, to make their comments. And my suggestion would be also that they also direct uh, some questions towards our speakers. So Professor Lee, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to all the speakers uh, for your excellent uh, uh, speech about the uh, topic uh, you have addressed. It's really cover all the key issues that I think most of the academics were concerned about the CAI. And I have a question to uh, first to Adina. Uh, Adina, it's about, you know, we, you made it very clear. Actually, there is no final agreement. This is a, work, a, working, a working out process because of ISDS and uh, also even the investment protection chapters are not there. But uh, in the first session, we also heard people comment on the CAI because they say, actually, because now uh, the CAI as it is does not include SDS. So it will prevent that the uh, agreement to be uh, to have to be approved by all the national uh, 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 legislature, even the, I think uh, Julian mentioned something like more than even 40 uh, uh, national level authorities. So I could you explain a little bit on the one hand, you know, uh, we predicate in two years, there will be an ISDS. So in the end, according to the European Court of uh, Justice, the ruling, so if uh, CAI include SDS, it need approval of all the member states. But on the other hand, now it's also so, uh, so often used as an argument that it is better to not include SDS in the CAI for the approv approval procedure. So I would like to hear your opinion. And uh, secondly, I would like to ask Chiman Jiao, you mentioned there are growing numbers of cases, uh, ISA cases against China. So my question is, just in case, in case if uh, uh, in the uh, one award is made uh, uh, that in China's disadvantage, in case China has to pay compensation to the foreign investors, what is the applicable law in China that uh, to uh, provide procedure for enforce and execute such uh, a word? My section to Duming is you emphasize, if I'm, I'm clear, you said, you know, that SDS reform, Ch China's position in the uh, SDS reform in terms of the CAI and the ANSITRA working group three are two issues. I would, uh, I don't understand how you see it's two issues. Do you see a kind of, will be a consistent policy for China that uh, what they will agree in the CAI will be also in the end, same as in the ANSITRA uh, working group three? That's my question, thank you. Uh, many thanks indeed, Ewan, for those very good and indeed important uh, questions to our three speakers. Before coming back to the panelists, I would like to give the floor to my colleague, uh, Dr. Ben, for his questions and remarks. Daniel, the floor is yours. Hi. <clears throat> thank you, Matteo. Thank you, Julian, for uh, having me here. Uh, and thanks to the speakers for excellent presentations as well. Uh, <clears throat> I don't have much to offer here in terms of uh, questions. Uh, I just make a few comments uh, that hopefully open up discussion later on, which is in the preliminary part of the previous session, I hear that, well, if, if 
if the investment agreement doesn't have ISDS in it, then it's 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 not a, a, an investment agreement or it doesn't uh, uh, have much value. And I would say that that's absolutely true in most of the previous generation treaties that have been signed and agreed to is that they provide basically no obligations between the states uh, in regards to facilitation of investment or promotion of investment or um, anything of that regard. And uh, but what we have here is possibly, and I don't know in detail, uh, is that there, you have an agreement that is is able to uh, that ha that does create obligations between the states, and that ISDS is uh, and protection of foreign investments by allowing foreign investors to have this remedy after the fact when an investment goes sour uh, may not be so important anymore. It may not in in this type of agreement be a necessity. Now, I will say that in the context of, it's not surprising to me that that this agreement has stalled on that issue. I mean, this issue becomes quite controversial and. In the end, I mean, particularly the dogma that that has been instituted by the European Union, which I would say that in terms of capacity building, that as capacity has improved, because you admittedly have uh, been are fairly new to this topic, uh, that a lot of the of the issues that that have been clung onto sort of very rigidly may be loosened up. Uh, the Chinese, you know, if there's an issue with, with, uh, with the problems of consistency and trying to figure out a way to review across uh, tribunals uh, in a way that creates some kind of consistency in the case law, which it's not unsurprising that it's not consistent, not because of ad hoc tribunals, but because you're, they're all being adjudicated under different tri different treaties. Uh, so it's not surprising that that you do have variations. Uh, but the Chinese are definitely, especially in the UNCTRAL process, they've put up a flag that they're more than just uh, ambivalent about the investment court system. They've gotten pretty close, as far as I can tell, to wanting some type of appellate review or being open to the idea of some type of appellate review in those reform efforts, but not that they're going to, uh, uh, but it seems that they have not been able to garner the support of the of the of the European Union has not been able to garner the support of, of the Chinese in regards to a, a full blown multilateral investment court system. And from what I can tell, observing the uh, the 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 UNCTRAL negotiations, which I've been at most of the meetings, uh, is that the uh, there's less of less and less and less of an appetite for what the EU is proposing. Uh, mostly because of just some of the problems of establishing a new international institution in a time when most international institutions are coming under fire. Uh, there's not much of an appetite for it. Uh, and probably also doesn't necessarily fix all of the problems as optimistically as, as they were portrayed in the presentation just given. Um, but I'll, so I think that it's okay that there's no ISDS in the Chinese uh, European Union agreement. I think that the that uh, there's there's a lot to there's problems that are being created by uh, the European Union uh, sticking to such a, a rigid uh, line on on, a, on a, the establishment of a court uh, in solving the problems that are very relevant to ISD or very apparent in ISDS as it's currently practiced. Uh, but that perhaps uh, more flexibility uh, would benefit uh, uh, everybody uh, in that regard. So I'd just as a bit of an antagonism uh, to to uh, to push the discussion forward and uh, see how you go from there. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for those very thought provoking uh, uh, comments. Uh, I don't see at the moment any questions on the chat, so I really would like to make sure that uh, our uh, audience, I mean, raises any questions they may have uh, on the chat, but I would also like to make sure now that our four speakers get the chance to respond to the comments made by you and, and uh, Daniel. So may I suggest that each and every speaker takes two to three minutes uh, uh, to answer the questions which were raised. And I would suggest here that we also follow the order of the program, starting with Adinda. So Adinda, if you would like to start. 
Yes, thank you very much. And thank you also to the other speakers and to the discussants for those very interesting comments. Uh, maybe I will start with the question by Professor Lee Yuven. Um, it is indeed true that uh, the current CHI uh, does not include those provisions that would make it a mixed agreement. So if we now continue our negotiations and we negotiate a separate investment protection agreement, that will have the characteristics um, of making it a mixed agreement or a shared, at least a shared competence. Uh, if you look at what we have done in other agreements, um, then you will see that this type of agreements uh, would normally then also have to be ratified by the uh, parliaments in, in the EU member states because it is a shared competence. On the other hand, strictly legally speaking, a shared competence means that the EU could also exercise that competence so that theoretically it's not excluded that it could be in, in, uh, decided at the level of the EU only, but politically um, it is more likely that it would be the same type of agreement as other investment protection agreements and it would follow the same mechanism of, of uh, approval uh, going also through the national parliaments. Um, what the contents of it um, um, are concerned, um, I, I heard the last speaker saying that maybe the EU would need also a bit more flexibility um, to in, in, in this respect. I think it's true that the EU has not been very flexible, but for very good reasons. I think politically, there is absolutely no, um, no, no, no position anymore that we could in the EU ever have traditional ISDS anymore. It's simply a no-go. So um, apart from the legal concerns that may also exist and uh, thinking about uh, what Professor Tung Chibos was, was raising, um, about the compatibility um, with, with, with the EU treaties, which has not been checked because what has been checked was the compatibility of the ICS. And we know the ICS is compatible. Would ISDS be compatible? We don't know, but we are not going to test it because it's simply no longer on, on, on our radar screen. It will not go anywhere. It will not go to any national parliament, but also not through the European parliament. So in that sense, and there are not that many other options. If you think about the systemic reform, uh, the only systemic reform you can do to, to ad hoc um, party appointed arbitrators is making it closer to a court. Uh, there can be some variations in how you appoint that, but it, there is not so much flexibility on, uh, on, on the nature itself of, of what that would be. So that would be my, my reply to, to some of the main comments made. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Adinda. Um, and um, let me now pass the floor to Manjiao. Yeah, um, thank you, Matthew. And I would like to also thank uh, uh, Professor Lee and Daniel for the uh, insightful uh, comments and questions. And Professor Lee's question actually uh, to me, from a, an academic perspective, is is not a, a a difficult one, but to China, it could be a very difficult one. Uh, it regards the enforcement of uh, arbitral awards, uh, investor uh, state arbitral awards in China. Um, uh, Let's let's just try to divide into two different types of uh, uh, awards. If We can't hear you, Manjiao. It seems that there is a connection issue. Uh, maybe may, may I suggest, if, if you don't mind, since Manjiao has a connection issue, that we move on to you, Ming, and then we'll come back to uh, Manjiao afterwards. Thank you. Uh, you're, you're on mute. <laughs> OK, thank you, Matthew. Um, I, um, I'm, so so should, should we come back to uh, Professor Chi now? Oh, uh, Manjiao is back, so maybe, yes, uh, Manjiao, Manjiao, the floor is yours, sorry, you are, you are back, you, you were disconnected. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I don't know uh, the reason I was disconnected. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Professor Du, uh, for the uh, interruption. Uh, 
uh, back to uh, Professor Lee's question, I, I think the question from an academic perspective is um, is actually uh, uh, not difficult, but from um, uh, China's perspective, it could be a little bit um, uh, difficult now. Uh, as regards the exit award, exit convention requires member states um, to which China is a member. Uh, enforce the exit award as the the final uh, judgment of um, of the uh, domestic court um, but in china of course um, the, the thing is that um, uh, the procedure uh, the exit convention allows the member states to use its own procedure uh, when enforcement uh, enforcing the, the exit award but in china there is simply no such uh, procedure in place. Uh, I heard the, the Supreme People's Court uh, has been contemplating uh, the procedure for quite a few years, uh, or at least quite a few years ago, but still uh, there is no um, no clue uh, where, where we are uh, with regard to enforcement of uh, uh, such kind of award. Um, and um, if that is an, um, a non-exit uh, award, and then it goes to um, uh, New York Convention, uh, while New York Convention is silent um, uh, with regard to investor state award, uh, arbitration award, it is, uh, I think it's beyond dispute that the convention can be applied uh, for the enforcement of uh, ISDS or uh, investment arbitration award. Um, and China is a member of the um, um, New York Convention, but China makes uh, a, a very clear uh, reservation, and the reservation is res with regard to the commercial uh, commercial uh, uh, nature of the dispute. Um, China actually uh, it very exclu uh, explicitly excludes uh, investor state arbitration award from uh, the uh, the uh, and uh, the um, application scope of the New York Convention in China. And therefore, I would say uh, from a practical perspective, uh, simply there is no way uh, to enforce such an award in China. And uh, on top of that, we still need to consider the issue of uh, 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 sovereign uh, immunity. Uh, state immunity issues because China adheres to the um, uh, um, absolute immunity doctrine, uh, which basically means uh, it's almost difficult, uh, impossible to enforce any exit award or um, uh, other kind of um, uh, investment state arbitration award in China against China or against other uh, countries. But at a deeper uh, perspective, I would also uh, like to take this opportunity to um, to go to uh, the inner, um, uh, the essence of this issue. Um, let's say even if uh, China has the procedure in place for enforcement of the awards, uh, by that moment, I think China should have already dealt with the very thorny issue of um, the constitutional setting. Uh, the reason is because of the current um, uh, fiscal and tax uh, division system in China. Um, uh, very often, um, the case were actually caused by local uh, administrative uh, bodies, especially the administrative bodies has actually committed illegal uh, contacts, uh, illegal of Chinese law. And then these kind of uh, contacts raised um, gives rise to a dispute, uh, but then that raises the the issue first of all from a constitutional perspective: who should really uh, bear the the uh, the compensation? Is the central government or the local government? Uh, central government, of course, bears the obligation under international law to pay compensation, but then afterwards, the central government would want uh, the money back because of the division between a uh, tax. And then the other issue is about accountability issue. Uh, this, of course, is a different issue. I would not uh, go into uh, details, but what I want to say is that the, the enforcement of the word uh, uh, investment arbitration word in China is not only a technical issue, which uh, we don't have the uh, the procedural rules to uh, to facilitate, but more importantly, it is also a constitutional issue, which still we are um, stuck somewhere. Um, very uh, quickly, if I may, uh, respond to Daniel's uh, comments uh, with regard One to the minutes, Manjo, please. Yes, yes, of course. Um, I think, uh, of course, EU's uh, flexibility is limited um, because of its mandate. Um, but I, I think EU has shown some flexibility, and then I, I agree with uh, 
uh, uh, Daniel and, and Dinda, that um, um, China actually shares certain common grounds with the EU um, with regard to um, um, a lot of fronts like um, conciliation um, or um, uh, appeal system. But of course, as to the details, we don't know yet. Um, let's wait and see. So uh, back to you, Matthew. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Manjiao. Um, I, let me pass the floor to uh, Ming, and maybe Ming, if you would like indeed to address uh, together with the comments a comment, a question which has been raised on the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, if ISDS is a no-go for the EU and China expresses less and less appetite for multilateral investment court system, mm -hmm. is there any possibility for the EU and China to come up to an agreement in the context of <laughs> those upcoming negotiations <laughs> in the context of the, of the CAI in the months and two years to come. Thanks, Matthew. And also I thank my uh, two commentators. I mean, great insights. Let me uh, briefly address uh, Professor Lee's uh, question, why I think there's a, we are talking about different questions about the future of SDS in, in, in CAI and uh, ANSTRO. So you ought to ask our question, the real question, what does the channel want from SDS reform? So, or in other words, what are China's concerns? What does China want? I mean, clearly China wants, as everyone says, wants kind of a pallet body system. And China also wants to retain some control in appointing those adjudicators, arbitrators, whatever you name them. Then if, we, if this is what China wants, then if you look at the discussions at Ancestral, three problems. First, China does not have the level of control it wants. Second problem, why permanent investment court system is better than another option, let's say kind of a petty body system in, in exit. So from China's perspective, you know, it does not use idea, does not necessarily you know, offer something better for China to support a different uh, option. Third, so what will the discussions, all discussions that at Anstro leading us to, we currently have 12 different options. Talk for another two years, probably you still have five or six on the table, right? So, so is there any rush or is there any incentive for China to support European Union at Ancestral? No. China has enjoyed a very healthy both inbound and outbound FDI. So, you know, China can be relaxed about it. But, can be quite relaxed about this. And this is corresponds to what Daniel has said. We are seeing less and less support of China uh, to European Union's investment court system. But then let's move to a bilateral CHI scenario. And clearly, do China have the similar concerns at Ancestral? The answer is no. Why? Because China can, when at the bilateral setting, China can return the level of control China wants, both at the first instance adjudicators and second instance. And also moreover, from China perspective, this could be a very healthy, productive experimental ground for China to test ideas. But, so basically, if a U European Union puts this two level investment court system in the, in the CHI, what objections could China raise? Okay, this idea addresses all your concerns. So, so what are the problems? So I think that's probably that two different questions, simply because it takes place at either bilateral or multilateral setting. So that's a uh, way they lead to a different attitudes. Many thanks, uh, many thanks, Ming. Uh, let me now pass the floor uh, to uh, Tong for the last set of uh, answers. Yeah, uh, there is no question for me, but I want to make a very short comment on the different uh, paths between EU and uh, China. Uh, uh, as we learned from the recent uh, uh, ANSITRA, uh, the 40th conference of the ANSITRA uh, uh, working um, uh, group uh, three, uh, I heard a lot of uh, representative uh, support uh, the right of parties to appoint uh, arbitrators at the first instance stage. Uh, so uh, I'm not I, I'm not to say China's uh, uh, China's play is good uh, is is better than, than EU. Uh, I just want to say uh, the. Uh, uh, the EU's uh, uh, 
plan on the establishment of, of a multinational investment court, uh, which uh, may uh, is not uh, uh, cannot address uh, all the pro uh, uh, cannot address all the problems in the current ISDS uh, regime. Uh, so uh, nothing is perfect. Uh, nothing is per perfect. Uh, uh, so, uh, but everything is possible. Uh, uh, we, we still need uh, space for, the, for, for the uh, coming negotiations. Uh, uh, that's, uh, that's my very short comments. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, indeed, Tong. And uh, I don't see any more questions on the chat. So I would suggest that we uh, wrap up uh, this uh, session. Mateo, can I just say one, one Daniel, more, please, just please. briefly on the on the on the whole, just to bear in mind as you go forward with all of this, is that for some reason there's an assumption that that even if three, four, or five years out down the road, this ISDS reform process in Uncetral will bear any fruit, it's important to bear in mind that it was not set up to establish a multilateral investment court, uh, and uh, the. The other thing that's very important is that nothing may come of it. The whole process was to discuss and to get the parties together to uh, think about what are the issues and what are the possible reform options that could be feasible uh, within a system of bilateral treaties. Uh, but that does not mean that there will be, well, first of all, that there will be any, any outcome of, of this, but even if there is an outcome, remember that all the parties, the only way that it will work is if all the parties to the current system, which is almost every country in the world to some degree, sign on to it and agree to it, whatever the architecture is and whatever it calls for and whatever it allows. And it may allow multiple options. Uh, it may be uh, an a la carte sort of menu as, as some have called it. Uh, there's nothing that this is, there's a mandate to produce something that then every country, it's not a multilateral treaty negotiation process. So that's something really important to keep in mind is that if you are going to, to leave everything to the outcome of this process, uh, you may be disappointed uh, in five or six years when not much comes of it or there's not much uh, uh, adherence to or, uh, buying into whatever the product is that they produce uh, by states. Thank you uh, for this clarification indeed, uh, Daniel. And I think this brings this session to an end. I, I would say it's, it was really yet another fantastic panel. So really a big thank you to our four panelists and to uh, discussions. I mean, it is very clear that we haven't said much about, uh, um, you, I mean, the text itself doesn't tell us much. I mean, uh, when you look at the agreement as it, as it has been agreed in principle, but that much, I mean, is yet to be discussed in the two years to come. I, I really valued the fact that all our speakers also looked very much at uh, developments within the EU, but also developments within China. I mean, when the overall perspective on ISDS and ICS uh, is concerned, not only from the Chinese perspective, this idea of a cautious approach, the importance of capacity building, which was, I think, a very important point made by uh, Man Jiao. And indeed, within the European Union, the very difficulty to sell to EU member states the idea of an old style ISDS, bearing in mind in particular the saga which took place when there was the ratification process of the comprehensive agreement, uh, trade agreement with Canada, uh, bearing in mind what happened in my home region, the Walloon region, uh, which created some troubles in the process that finally led to the ratification of this agreement. And in that regard, I mean, uh, uh, the comments made by Professor Lee as to uh, the, the upcoming uh, ratification process is, I think, a very important one with this kind of open question of whether the non-mixed nature of the comprehensive agreement was on it, as it stands will lead to more or less, I mean, politicization of the comprehensive agreement on investment. Um, it seems that within the parliament, uh, within the European parliament, a number of political parties have already claimed, have already voiced their concerns regarding the uh, comprehensive agreement on investment. But at the same time, it is probably more likely that a qualified majority will be reached 
within the Council of the EU on the one side and a simple majority within the European Parliament, then what would have been the situation if an ISDS or ICS clause would have been included in the agreement, namely uh, uh, an agreement which would then have been considered as a mixed agreement, which would have required the ratification by almost 40 national and subnational parliaments. So thank you very much indeed again very much to our four uh, speakers, and I would like now to give the floor back to Julien, uh, who will take the lead on the conclusions for this event. Thank you very much again. Well, thank you, Mathieu. I'll be short. Uh, first of all, really, I truly enjoy this first webinar. Uh, it's very tempting to carry on the discussion, but I feel we better stick uh, to our program um, that we only exceeded by, by 10 minutes. Uh, we could not cover all the aspects of the CAI to them, and I think that you are all aware of that. Um, but the good news is that uh, we will have um, another webinar on March uh, 29, so in exactly three weeks, um, same place, if I dare to say on Zoom, exactly the same format, two sessions, uh, roughly six, seven speakers, and the same time, same duration. Uh, circumstances, as you know, as what they are. And instead of a big, long event, Mathieu and I decided to have shorter events, a kind of series of events. Um, so next time we'll be talking about uh, labor, uh, environment, and sustainable uh, development, some very important aspects of the CEI, as well as ratification in both the EU and uh, China, because we, we already understood today that the, the ratification prospects were also uh, one of the many variable in the uh, negotiations of this um, of this treaty. I think it's also important next time to talk about ratification because uh, you have seen many, a lot of criticism expressed in the, in the newspapers about the CAI. Um, and there are some legal aspects which are very interesting when it comes to uh, treaty ratification. And that's what we are going to, to look into. Um, I'd like to, to size the opportunity also to mention that Mathieu and I we'll put together a special issue in, in a journal and we'd like to include many of you in projects. Um, you know the, the saying, the wall is greater than the sum of the parts. Uh, so I think there is interest in working together on this kind of project. Um, it makes sense also because we've had very rich presentation with very few overlaps. Um, I took many notes and what I propose is very simple. Mathieu and I will follow, will follow up by email with more details on this uh, special issue uh, very soon. Not tomorrow morning, but very likely in the, the coming weeks and before the next uh, webinar. Um, the last point I want to make and I will close here is simply to, to thank again our speakers uh, for their very interesting and, and stimulating contributions. So um, it's been it's been very good. I think we also got very good questions. So it's been a very lively discussion and that's something we all appreciated, I hope. For those of you in Europe, that's been a nice morning. For people like me in Asia, it's been a nice evening. Um, so I think it's just time to close on that. Uh, Gunnar, thank you very much. Uh, take care and hopefully see you again in three weeks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Many thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.